2018. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment, stack blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out.
2018. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment, stack blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. Hello and welcome back. Sorry we're a bit late, we're running a bit late today, but um, we're just ready now to start again. So in this track, next up is Asim from Microsoft. He's going to be talking to us about how to save the world one line at a time. 
He's also going to be tomorrow in the performance expert zone. So if you want to chat with him and find out more, you can catch him tomorrow at 1.25. And uh, without further ado, let's welcome Asim to the stage. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to my talk today. Uh, on saving the world one line at a time. Did I spell that right? Almost thought I wrote online at a time. Anyway, so uh, my name's Asim Hussein. You can find me on, on Twitter as Jawache. Um, I blog about various things on my website, asim.dev. I got the dev, got in there first, right? And I also am a developer advocate at Microsoft. I, I actually lead advocacy regional developer advocacy for EMEA. And we have a stand outside today, so if you want to come, you can chat to us later on about a whole bunch of different things. All right? I'm also pretty environmentally conscious. Okay? Have been for a fair chunk of my life. We, we recycle as a family. I don't drive like a gas-guzzling machine, a pretty lightweight car. Um, I, I do grocery shopping in a market, so I don't have lots of plastic. I carry insane sized plastic bottles around with me everywhere. If you see me in an airport, I'm probably looking around for a refillable tap somewhere, right? That's me. These are things I'll do for the environment, okay? It's my son, Micah, yeah, 10 months old. I'm not too sure what it is about this picture. But I just get the impression that he loves his dad. Um, and something that we agreed on when, when he was born is that I would do all the nappy changes. Okay, some advice I was given by, uh, by Brandon. It was really great advice, actually. So, you know, it's, it's quality time that I spend with my son. I do all the nappy changes, right? And then my wife said, actually, we're going to use cloth nappies. Not disposable nappies. Cloth nappies. Any parents in the house? Any cloth nappy users in the house? Well done. Well done. Okay, you know, you know the pain about to talk about, right? So basically, you suck it up, right? With a, cloth, with, a, with a disposable nappy, when they do a shit, you just chuck it away. With a cloth nappy, you have to deal with it. Okay? You've got to wash it. You don't throw a cloth nappy away. And he shits. Eight times a day. It's a lot of shit. A lot. Okay? Um, and just for months, I was covered in shit. I'd be on, like, meetings, and someone would go, what's that on your face, Asim? And I'd be like, oh, oh, it's just some shit. Don't worry. That's what I would do for the environment. That's what I would do. Be covered in shit. I was happy to do it. It's fine. Right? And then I had like an epiphany like four or five months ago. I was like, I realized like I was willing to deal with shit eight times a day. I was willing and happy to do that. And yet, I couldn't remember a single time in any scrum meeting, in any point where we had to make an architectural decision about an application, I couldn't remember a single time where I'd asked, well, actually, what's the greener option? Not once. We would sit there and argue for ages about what's the faster technology, what gives you better SEO, what gives you better performance for the, for the end user, what's the cheaper option, what's, what, what option has the least risk with least bugs. We'd argue about this for hours on end, but not once had you ever said, well, actually, what's the greener option? Then I thought, well, actually, what does that even mean? Like, in terms of what we do as technologists, and specifically web, web technologists here, what does that mean? How do you make those decisions? Right? And that's kind of the journey that I've been on over the last uh, quite a few months now to, to hear. And that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today is, well, A, why, why are we talking about climate change now? Like, why, why are you hearing about it a lot more? And we'll have a, I'll cover that briefly that, that, that now. And what does green mean? Like, what should you do? Should you start walking around wearing hemp? Sandals, or like, what, what is it? What do you do? Like, as technologists, what can you do which has the most impact? And that's some of the things I'm going to talk to you about as well. And also, what other things can you do today? Because as technologists, we actually have a huge amount of power and influence 
in this world, right? There's a lot that we can do and there's a lot that we can, that we can help. So what can you do today in addition to help out with that area? Um, all right, so why now? Why is everybody talking about this stuff right now? One thing about me is uh, you might, if you've been to some of my talks before, I like to make things a little bit interactive, right? There's usually quizzes. Ask the audience. Gonna ask the audience now. All right, so there have been five mass extinctions. It's a bit depressing one. There's five mass extinctions in the world. And that means that where over half of all life has died, right? Five. So the first one was 445 million years ago. How did it happen? Any guesses? You get a cookie. There's no cookies. Okay. Yeah, climate change. I think this one was a, a whole load of eruptions happened over a, not like a year, but like a thousand years or something, and then that, that caused a lot of carbon dioxide to go into the atmosphere. All right, second one. 375 million years ago, 75% of all life died. Any guesses? Climate change, exactly, there you go. Next one, the big death. 95% of all life died, 95%, okay? What was it? An asteroid. <laughs> ah, now you're thinking, you thought, is it, it's going to be messed, am I going to mess, mess around with you now, aren't I? Is the next, what's the next one going to be? Is it going to be climate change? Is it? Okay, go on, next one. 200 million years ago, 70%. What is it? <laughs> climate change. There you go. But now I'm still screwing with you because there's one more, right? What's the next one? What's the next one? You know, I wouldn't be messing around with you unless there's, oh, what's going on? Ah, oh, you might get something wrong. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the, the next one, uh, six, six million years ago, that, that dinosaur looks very familiar, doesn't it? 75% um, of all life died. What was it? Bit of both. Ah. So it was a whole load of climate change. Then an asteroid came along and just took it over the edge, right? That's, well, that's, the, that's the prevailing theory. This is a lot, lot of time ago, right? That's the prevailing theories. And right now, people talk about how there's a current one happening at the moment, okay? Um, so, whether you believe it's man-made or not, it kills. It just kills. Right? That's just a fact, right? It's just a fact. Uh, what is it? Just to give a, um, a summary. So, basically, we're talking about something called the greenhouse effect, where essentially there are these greenhouse gases that exist in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is the main one. It's like having a blanket on the planet. It just heats it up so as energy comes in, it, it traps the energy and it keeps it inside and, and doesn't let it escape. Uh, we need some in the atmosphere, otherwise the planet would be Fahrenheit. I don't know, guys. I don't know what that is in, in centigrade, but it's something, right? Like a very low temperature. So we need some in the atmosphere to keep it at the current temperature. But right now, what's happening is we're pumping a whole load up and it's making things even warmer. Just to give a, a little bit of a, so we can talk about things in a, uh, just to explain some terminology. So we talk a lot about carbon dioxide and carbon in the atmosphere. What we're, we're talking about is something called carbon dioxide equivalent. There's many different types of greenhouse gases. There's carbon dioxide for one of them. There's methane as well. There's lots of others. Methane, for instance, has a much higher greenhouse effect than carbon dioxide. One ton of methane is equivalent to 25 tons of carbon dioxide. And that's why we kind of collapse it all into one metric, which is called the carbon dioxide equivalent, right? CO2e. Right. That's what we believe is going on. That's what we believe is causing climate change. Well, 97% of scientists agree that climate change is, climate change is happening, and then it's man-made. This is uh, through a study of 2,000 peer-reviewed papers. And I read that, and two things struck me, which was like, 97%. What if 97% of people agreed on anything? And then I, then I thought, who are those 3%? Who are they? What do they think is happening? So I did some research, and I found this other website that's really interesting called Skeptical Science. And what they had done is they'd taken those 2,000 
papers and done some additional data science on them, bucketed them together by expertise in climate science of the authors. Okay? And so what, you sh what it showed was the more of an expert you were in climate science, i.e. a climate scientist, the more you believed it was happening and that it was man-made, the less of an expert you're at climate science, the less you believe it's happening is man-made. The dumber you are, the less you, the more intelligent you are, the more you believe, okay? So climate change is happening, and it's man-made. I'm not gonna argue with anybody. There's always, there's gonna be people in this room. Every time I give this talk, there's always somebody who heckles me and starts arguing with me. There's always a three percenter in the audience. I'm not talking to you. Um, that's not why I'm here. Um, but it is just happening, it's man-made. There's another number you might have heard about, one and a half degrees. So um, in the April 2016, 192 states agreed in the Paris Agreement to try and keep the temperature increase on the planet to one and a half degrees. Well, less than two degrees, ideally one and a half degrees. There's already been a one degree increase in temperature since pre-industrial times. And that was another number that blew me away. I was like, two, one and a half degrees. I couldn't tell the difference. That's such a small number, that can't mean anything. Why is that so important, this small number? So I did some other research, there's a really great website called Carbon Brief, which has collected a whole bunch of information together from various sources to look at the effects on the planet from these different temperature increases. And you can see at one and a half degrees, yeah, one and a half degrees, uh, so this is the proportion of, this is one of the slides, the proportion of species losing 50% of their climatic range. When we get hot or cold, we take clothes off and on, right? Something like that. Uh, well, animals and plants can't do that, right? They just die. So basically, so at one and a half degrees, you can see there's, you're still mostly in single digits, insects, right? But we need insects, right? There we go. Two degrees, we're getting into double digits. Yeah? Survivable, maybe, but not great. Four and a half, we're, we're, we're pretty screwed, right? Pretty screwed. Four and four is it's a really bad place to get to is four. Right? That's why those small numbers is really, really, really important. And here's the thing, here's the thing, to remain below the one and a half degree limit that we've kind of set for ourselves, that, that very kind of reasonable limit that we can comfortably survive in, we need to cut our carbon pollution by 45% by 2030, 11 years, right? And we need to get to zero by 2050. We're nowhere near, we're not even slightly, a little bit close to achieving those goals, right? Um, we're not even at the point where we're reducing the rate of carbon pollution. We're actually increasing year by year. It's, it's increasing by 5% every single year, and has been for, for quite a while now. We haven't even reached peak pollution to start going down, right? Um, to remain at a 2 degree C, we need to cut by 20% by 2030, which is still a, a, an incredibly challenging thing to achieve. We need to get to zero by 2075, right? And that's why everybody, that's what you're hearing about it. That's why everybody's getting pissed off. Because we're not on track. We're not even remotely on track. We're not even close. Okay? And that's the thing that not one, it's not like one person has to do one thing. Everybody has to do one thing. Every country has to do one thing. Every country has to do a thousand things, right? And that's why we get involved, because we can do something. Okay? We can have an impact. And so what does green mean for us as technologists? What does it mean to be a green, to write a green application? Because many things you can do. You can worry about um, acidification of the, of the oceans. You can worry about plastic consumption. There's many different things you can, you can worry about, right? For us, the easiest way for us to have an impact here is to look at electricity, OK? So electricity, the creation of electricity is responsible for 30% of the greenhouse gases, uh, the pollution that's going on. Right? And that's because 80% of the electricity is created through the burning of fossil fuels. Right? 
So if we make your apps use less electricity, that's a really simple, clear, and impactful way that you can do something positive for the environment. And you are a technologist, so you're not just doing it for yourself. You're building something that is used by thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people. So you actually can have a really big impact in this world. You can have a really big impact in this solution, right? Um, so let's talk about this. Let's talk about it from, from multiple different angles. And I've, done, I've been speaking to quite a few people over the last six months to kind of figure, figure out where I should put, be spending my time and effort in. And I'm hopefully going to impart this onto you. There's kind of three parts in what we build. We kind of got the, the client front end. We've got the networking, which you don't really think about. But the network is actually just loads of computers at the end of the day. And then we've got the server side itself as well, which again just the computer. So looking at the front end, okay, the client side. Another quiz. Right, what uses, for doing the same task, what uses more electricity? Desktop or laptop? Ooh. Who reckons desktop uses more electricity? Who reckons laptop? Desktop. Desktop uses more electricity because laptop is powered by a battery, right? Anything that's powered by a battery these days has a lot of effort to improve battery performance. So actually, if uh, your laptops are actually very, very efficient compared to a desktop, a desktop they don't really care. They know it's going to be plugged into electricity. It's going to have all the electricity it needs in the world. There's no need to optimize that hardware to use less electricity. So actually, on our, on our phones, or mobile devices, or tablets, a whole kind of client-side front-end world is moving off of battery-powered devices, which are making it very, very efficient. Okay? Even things like Chrome and the browsers and, and Edge and these things, they, they really focus a lot on, on, on battery performance of the, of the sites you build. Right? OK. But then it kind of, so then you, you don't have to worry too much about the front end, uh, there are things you can do. Um, made me also wonder about kind of well, well what language should we, we be building our applications in, right? Because some languages to solve the same problem are going to use more electricity than other languages, right? There's been a study done. I'm going to show you a a, a, a screenshot, and it's going to show you the the language on the first column, and next to it is going to be uh, how much how energy efficient it is. And the top one's going to be most energy efficient. And the bottom one's going to be least. And you're going to start scanning it as soon as I move the slide forward. One, two, three. There you go. We're kind of like JavaScript 4.45 at the bottom. TypeScript is 21 point, which I think it's including the transpilation time from TypeScript to JavaScript. I don't think that's particularly fair. Right, because it's the same as, as JavaScript essentially in terms to run, but right at the top is like C and and, and Rust. Um, probably not going to be building my front end applications in Rust just yet, but it's quite interesting, right? What do we maybe build the server sides of our applications in? It's pretty pretty efficient technology, um, and then it kind of makes you, makes you think about WebAssembly as well. It makes you think about it in a different light. That WebAssembly wasn't in that report, but actually, when you think about it, compiling things to WebAssembly is going to make it much more efficient to run. Going to use less electricity. Talk about the network. Okay, so this is probably where you have a much, much more impact in the work that you do if you want to reduce the carbon impact to your applications. Um, oh, another question. Here we go. Wi-Fi or mobile networks? What uses more electricity for the same data? Who reckons Wi-Fi? <laughs> Who reckons 3G, 4G? <laughs> 3G, 4G, yeah. It's about seven to 10 times more, right? Because it's all using towers and stuff. And it, it basically does use a lot more 
um, electricity to transport the same amount of megabytage down to your devices. So some things you can consider, there's actually a network uh, diagnostics, I think API, that's available in quite a few browsers now, which will actually tell you the network, whether you're on a 2G, 3G, perhaps consider using that and conditionally serving different types of data, depending on whether you're a 2G, 3G. Um, there's lots of studies, it's they're very, very, and it's, this, this number is changing a lot, so take this with a, a, a pinch of salt. But this is a kind of an average number that I found, which looks pretty reasonable across all the studies about the amount of carbon that's generated per megabyte of data transmitted, right? 10 grams of carbon. Is that a lot? Is that a lot? I don't know. What is 10 grams of carbon? What does it look like? I find it very hard to conceptualize what, what, what this really means. Then I found this site, it's called Tweet Farts, okay? What somebody had figured out is through the Twitter infrastructure, if you send a tweet, it, you, it creates uh, 0.2 grams of carbon, a single tweet, which is actually exactly the same amount as a human fart. So every tweet is equal to a human fart, believe it or not. Um, so there's another way of thinking about it. It's actually 50 farts. It's easy to conceptualize, isn't it? 50 farts. That's a lot of farts, isn't it? It's a lot. The average website is 2.4 megabytes still. 2019, still 2.4 meg megabytes. Or 120 farts. Yeah, it's the average website. There's already a lot of pressure on us to kind of reduce the amount of data we send down the pipe for, our, for, for websites, right? But this is just another reason to, to think about it, okay? Another reason. Reducing the amount of data you send on, on the network can have a, a far greater impact than anything you can particularly do on the front end in terms of optimizing your code, right? So optimize the data that gets sent down. Empty slide. Oh, another one. So REST versus GraphQL. What would you use less electricity? You think it's REST? You think it's GraphQL? I don't know. I think it's GraphQL. I think, so I think GraphQL is, is going to use less electricity. Because at the end of the day, from a client side, you can then say, I only want the subset of the data. I only want specifically what I need. It's going to reduce the amount of data you send down the bandwidth. Now, what am I doing here? This is all, all I'm doing is, is making you start thinking about what's the greener option. That's all the goal is here. When you're sitting there in your, in your, in your, in your organizations and you're going you're gonna to discuss, um, uh, you're going to be make, making architectural decisions, just start asking yourself, what is the greener option? And just start thinking about it. I don't know what the answer is. We don't always know what the answer is, but just start asking the questions. Uh, just really quickly, uh, moving forward, on the server side, there's lots you can do. You have much more control on the server side because it's something you, you control and you own. You, you can control how the electricity gets consumed. Serverless is a really good solution that I particularly like in terms of this. So for those of you who don't know, serverless technology, uh, if you don't use serverless, then you deal with servers. And you have to figure out how many servers you need to deal with your load of the back end. And you have to scale it up and down. And oftentimes, you scale too much and you get too many servers, that's just wasted electricity, or worst case, you scale down too many and that's bad performance for the end user. So all, all, all cloud providers have now have a serverless platform where we basically just give you exactly the amount of compute that you need to solve your problems. Nothing gets wasted and that rest of that stuff gets used for somebody else, right? That's serverless and that serverless actually has a benefit in terms of the environment because you, you, you don't waste electricity. Uh, I read a statistic the other day, it was like 30-something um, thir percent of all servers in the world are in a comatose state. Comatose. And comatose is a specific definition, which means it hasn't, no, hasn't had any, any activity in six months. Right? Six months. And that, those, it might not be using electricity, but it still requires electricity to keep it physically in a data center. Right? So that's important. So serverless, auto scales, which is what's important, and you only pay for what you use. I have to do a little plug for what we're doing uh, at Microsoft and my team. So we built, uh, my, specifically my team internally, we built a product called 
we'll call Nitro. It's in Alpha. It's basically building backends for your application on serverless. It's based on a Nest.js framework. Um, includes database and file upload support. You can write as a Nest.js application and then just build, and it will turn it into a serverless application. Then you can kind of upload. You get automatic scaling, and you pay only for, any, only for what you use. You can come see me at the booth, and we've got a demo of it showing. All right, so moving on really quickly, because the, the best thing you can do, the best thing you can do on the server side is just to use clean energy, right? I said before that, that electricity is used, most electricity is created from the burning of fossil fuels. If data centers can actually just go, well, actually, we're only going to use electricity that's created from renewables, right? And if you're, if you're on a data center which is doing that, you can go wild. Right, because that electricity um, is not going to be cr creating any carbon uh, carbon gases. Two people, and I'm so glad my company is one of them, because that would make my life very weird. Two companies, uh, so Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, both of them are carbon neutral. Both carbon neutral companies. So everything that we do is, is offset through carbon credits. Even my flights, everything is offset by carbon credits, including all, all of our data centers. So every, anything that you use in terms of compute and anything is offset with carbon credits. Uh, and also, we buy some renewables as well. We're trying to get to 100% renewables. Google Cloud is exactly the same. They actually beat us a bit on the use of renewables, but still both 100% carbon neutral. Um, AWS, not, it's not so clear cut with AWS. Um, they're not a carbon neutral company, but if you run your workloads in these four data centers, those are the only four data centers, or regions, I should say, which are carbon offset. So Dublin, Frankfurt, Oregon, and Canada, any other of their regions, they're, they're not carbon offset. Okay? I'm really, I know I'm a bit late. Just a few more slides. Um, so what can you do today? There's a couple of things happening right now. Well, the one thing you can do is join a community called Climate Action Tech. Okay, a fantastic community. It's, like, it's basically, at the end of the day, it's a Slack room. If you go to Climate Action Tech, you can sign up, um, and they, they join you every Monday. And it's a wonderful Slack community. Like, it's not like a standard, and there's no like funny GIFs all the time and weird stuff happening. You can just ask, ask honest questions, and you get lots of people who really, really want to help, and they give you lots of answers. I've had, been connected with so many people and plugged into so many initiatives because of this. Right? If you really want to get involved, Join Climate Action Tech, and you'll find other people. We've seen people go, oh, oh, we work at the same company together. Oh my God, you're in the same room as me. You know, you, you discover people that way, right? Um, there's a climate strike happening tomorrow, all over the world, youth led, Greta Thunberg. So, a lot of stuff was happening right now is youth led by Greta Thunberg. We are, we're not youth anymore. Most of us aren't youth in this room, right? So, there's a big movement happening right now where they're going, you, you're basically screwing up our planet. We're going to have to live here for the rest of our lives. There's a big climate strike happening tomorrow. In fact, of the five locations in the UK or in London, uh, one of them is just outside uh, this conference tomorrow. So for part of tomorrow, I'll probably be standing outside there as well to, to show my solidarity. There's other ways you can show your solidarity. You can join the digital climate strike. Um, so if you go to digital.globalclimatestrike.net, you can find a script tag which you can put on your website. If you go to my website right now, you'll see this banner at the bottom. Um, tomorrow, it'll be greened out, just for one day. I'm, I'm striking my website. Um, and then the next day, it'll come back again. So if you go to digital.globalclimatestrike, you can add that in. A bunch of companies are now getting involved. It's on about 5,000 websites right now, some big names. I think Dev2. Ben said he was going to join yesterday, so Dev2 is probably going to be hopefully joining um, by, by tomorrow. And those are the ways you can show solidarity. I will be having some stickers on the Microsoft stand tomorrow. Put them on your, put them on your laptop. Just you know, put, put them wherever. Show your solidarity for the strikers. Stop talking. So talk to anybody. It's fine. Like we, I, give a, I, I host a, a climate action call um, every other week. And, um, most important thing is to start talking to the people in your company. You will be surprised who else is actually interested in this. If you're in London, there's a meetup group called Clean Web London. It's actually having a meetup next week. I definitely recommend going to that and connecting with people. Okay, the most important thing is to connect. So to summarize, 
Okay? It's a climate emergency because we're not on track. That's what they call it. Climate. We're not on track to meet our targets. Right? We really need to meet those targets. Um, what can you do as technologists? Reduce the energy, energy and electricity that's being used to run your applications. Right? That's one thing you can do. Use clean energy if you can in your data center. This is the big one. And in fact, if you join Climate Action Tech, they even do cohorts where they, they help you to have those conversations with management to convince them to move, move, your, move your work over to something a bit more carbon neutral. Uh, again, join Climate Action Tech. Um, and, you know, strike, striking, you don't have to walk out the front door. Striking can happen in many different ways. You can support your solidarity by wearing a badge. You can just have a conversation. A lot of the things you can do, and I'm, I'm going to be striking tomorrow by standing at the stand uh, the, at the booth, answering any questions anybody have about, about climate change and, uh, and, helping, uh, and helping. And I also have lots of stickers as well. So thank you very much for your talk, for, for my talk. Thank you very much for my talk. And um, yeah, chat to me anytime. Cheers, bye. Thank you so much. There's a lot for us to take away from that, and you thanked yourself, so I don't need to do that. Um, so we've got a five-minute break now, and coming up next, uh, here we have Angler in the OWASP Top 10, and next door in track one, we have less servers through our Angler app. So um, see you soon. Thank you. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out.
Angular Connect 2018. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment, stack blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity. Hello, and welcome back. Thanks for coming into track two. So here, we're going to be hearing from Philip about um, Angular and OWASP top 10. You also can catch Philip later, um, when is it? This afternoon at 2 o'clock in the expert zone. So if you have more questions or want to find out more about the security, you should catch him there. And so without further ado, let's welcome Philip to the stage. Thank you. All right. Nice to see a full room for security, so I'm always enjoying that. So I'm going to introduce you to the OWASP top 10 in the world of Angular. So essentially, for those who don't know the real meaning of the OWASP top 10, the OWASP top 10 is an awareness document. It's something created by the OWASP Foundation to raise awareness about the really dangerous problems in web applications we face today. Well, today is kind of relevant. They have a new version every couple of years. So every couple of years, they build a new list of what they observe in real applications like these problems are there. They look at the impact of the problems. They look at how prevalent they are and how easy it is to exploit them. And based on that, they create a list. And you can see the 2007 version right here on the screen uh, showing you what the problems are in 2017. This is the OWASP top 10. What I'm going to talk about is how the OWASP top 10 applies to Angular applications. Because Angular applications are different. They are not really traditional web applications. You don't really generate pages on the server and send them to the browser for rendering, no. You load the application with traditional requests one time. You have your SPA, your single page application loaded. And at that moment, we're essentially 
calling APIs, we're doing things on the front end. And that kind of means, if we're talking about Angular, it also means, first of all, that we are kind of separating development. Yes, you can still build things together, but essentially you're going to have front end devs and back end devs, especially in a large organization. Whether it's the same person or not, it's different roles for potentially different people or um, one person who has to split his time between these things. So for the OWASP top 10, this kind of means a few things. So for example, injection is a server-side problem. Injection means SQL injection, command injection, things like that we have on the server, potential problems we typically see there. In the front end, they're a bit less relevant. I wouldn't say extremely irrelevant, but um, in my opinion, uh, we can rearrange the OWASP top 10 to make more sense for Angular. So this is a very personal, uh, biased view. It, maybe you don't agree with that. I'm happy to discuss that after the talk as well. But essentially, some of these issues matter more for Angular devs, and other issues are a bit less relevant in the space of Angular applications. I want to talk about three of them. I know it's called the OWASP top 10, but first of all, a few of them are irrelevant. Second of all, I only have 27 minutes left uh, to talk about these things, and I, I tried covering more, and it ended up at like 90 minutes, so I'm, I'm not going to keep you hostage for the rest of the hour. Uh, so let's talk about three here. Let's talk about the top three, and I want to start with cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting is a really, really nasty problem. It's essentially an attack where the attacker succeeds in executing JavaScript code in your application. And it occurs anytime some untrusted data ends up in the page, there's a potential cross-site scripting vulnerability. Anytime you put something into the page from a message, from the database, from the API in the backend, and you put it into the page, it's going to cause problems. And we've seen these problems everywhere. And if you want to know how prevalent cross-site scripting is, I can guarantee that almost every application will have them. And recently, we saw one on one of the most, I would say, the most secure pages in the world, the Google search page. Very simple. They have one input field. Yet, because of some weird browser behavior, there was a cross-site scripting vulnerability right there in that page. Just to show you how hard it is to prevent things like cross-site scripting. That's the bad part, the sad part of the story. Let's talk about XSS in Angular. That's the good part of the story. So the Angular team actually knew what they were doing when they built Angular, which is a good thing, since we all use Angular. So uh, thank you for that. So let's, let's look at what this means in Angular. On top, you have your untrusted code. So this is your Angular code. You put some untrusted data right in there. Untrusted data is something coming from user input. Doesn't matter how it ends up in the application, whether it's from a database or from a parameter or from an input field, whatever. It's the value that matters. And in this case, you see the value hello. That's kind of expected. And then somebody gives you a bit extra data, gives you an image tag. And that image is going to try to load unicorns.png which of course does not exist, so it's going to trigger the on error handler instead, and it's going to pop up an alert dialog when this gets executed. This is a textbook example for cross-site scripting. If you have a vulnerability, chances are that this payload will always work regardless of the scenarios that you're trying to exploit. Interesting. A side note here. The alert is really annoying, like this pop-up in the browser, and you have to click it away, and it keeps coming if you keep executing this payload. So it really annoys the hell out of you, but it's not really dangerous. But this is a very simple proof of concept. So a real attacker, obviously, is not going to insert alerts unless they want bug bounty, then it's a good way to show the vulnerability and collect on the money. But real attackers are going to insert real payloads. And the moment they can execute JavaScript, they can do whatever they want. If I can execute JavaScript in your application, I can make it do whatever I want. I can uh, start using permission API based APIs. I can grab images from the webcam if your app has permission to do that. I can use the microphone. I can get location information. I can deface your web page, which is, if they only do that, you got away very easy. That's good. But I can also start sending requests to the backend in the name of the user, and there's basically nothing you can do to stop that. So cross-site scripting, essentially for Angular, means game over. The moment XSS happens, if the attacker is skilled enough, you lose. There's simply no way to recover from that. That's a side note. So cross-site scripting, really, really dangerous. How does Angular handle this? Well, if you output this data in Angular, you're going to see that. Because Angular is not stupid. Angular knows very well, hey, I'm putting data into the page here with the curly brackets. That's exactly what that means. So I'm going to make sure that this data will be seen as data by the browser. The browser doesn't see this as code. The browser will not even look at how to execute that. Because the browser knows, oh, this is data. And it's going to show you the data. So in this case, that output is safe. That output will never trigger the execution of script code. 
in no circumstances, because everywhere where we put this, Angular applies something called strict contextual escaping, which means Angular is going to look like, hey, you're putting this right there, and I know that these things are dangerous there, so I'm not going to allow that to happen. And they have you covered. And that's good. This is awesome. Old applications, PHP, Java server pages, ASP, you had to do this yourself. Modern applications, server-side frameworks have something very similar today, but Angular applications on the front end do this automatically. And Angular is not alone. The other ones do it as well. React does it, and Ember does it, and I'm pretty sure Vue does it, even though I'm not too familiar with it, and so on and so on. So this is good. This is a massive step forward, so that's awesome. Of course, outputting HTML, if you want some fancy output, your business users are not going to be very happy. You're going to see HTML instead of very nice images or paragraphs or headers or whatnot. So this is only used for, for simple outputs. A name, sure, that's going to work. There's no HTML in your name unless you're really unfortunate, but you're going to have a lot of other problems with HTML-based names as well. I can guarantee that. But let's say you want some outputs that does contain some HTML. Well, Angular has the inner HTML binding. This is not a DOM API. It's not a DOM inner HTML. It's the Angular-based property to bind data into the DOM. And if you give it output like that, what's going to happen? Well, Angular is going to output that, and it knows like, hey, you want some HTML in the output, so, well, actually, you get the image. Well, you, you don't get the image because it doesn't exist, but you don't get the alert either. Because what Angular does here is it knows like, hey, I'm putting stuff, I'm putting untrusted data in inner HTML, and I know that that is a cause for major problems. Angular already knew that in Angular 1, they gave you an error and said, like, no, we're not going to do that. You could fix that error and get it right. But in Angular 2, they do this automatically. Every binding to inner HTML is automatically sanitized. And that means that Angular looks at your data and says, like, whoa, these features, I know that these are good. Like the bold, yeah, I know that's fine. Uh, the image tag, yeah, that's pretty cool. That's harmless. I'm going to allow that. On error attributes, no, I, I don't know what that means, so I'm going to take it out. If I don't know it, it's probably not safe, so I'm going to take it out and make sure you don't end up with any cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in your application. And this is absolutely awesome, because this means that by default, you are protected against cross-site scripting as an Angular developer. And that's pretty cool. Let me give you a few guidelines, because there's a few things you need to know to watch out for. So the good news of the story is that, first of all, you need to get out of the way. Just let Angular do whatever it does, because Angular is really good at that. Just do things the Angular way. Don't try to be smarter than Angular. Just do whatever Angular says. This is how you put data into the DOM, and you're good to go. Because it applies everywhere. The Angular way, binding to an href, you give it a URL like this, guess what a browser does? Ooh, JavaScript, boom, executes that. Just like that. However, when you try to do this in Angular, Angular is like, no, no, no. I know that you're putting this in a URL field. And I know that this JavaScript colon thing is very dangerous. Well, actually, Angular doesn't even know it's dangerous. It knows it's not safe because it doesn't recognize it. And it says, like, I'm not allowing that value in that URL field. And that is pretty, pretty awesome. By the way, as a side note, Angular is the only framework that does this by default. The other libraries, like React and Ember, they don't offer features like this. URLs are not protected there. You have to do that yourself as a developer. They don't do sanitization either. You have to do that yourself. It's not necessarily that hard to do it, but you have to figure that out yourself or include additional libraries and hope they offer this protection in a correct way. Angular does all of that automatically, and that's why I'm personally a big fan of Angular here. Second guideline is don't use functions that start with bypass security in the name. You can manage that, right? <laughs> why the bypass security? In Angular 1, the function was just called trust as HTML. And you will find code snippets on Stack Overflow, which we all use to build our applications, that actually misuse that function. And as an unknowing developer, you had no idea unless you actually looked up the documentation and figured it out on your own or watched one of my talks from back in the day. And that's why they renamed this to Bypass Security, because this will trigger a bell. If you copy-paste code from Stack Overflow and it says Bypass Security, that will make you think like, hmm, what, what should that mean? And that will trigger looking up the documentation and avoiding the use of that function. If you're building libraries, by the way, and you offer unsafe functions, always put something like that in the name, because it really works well in triggering developers to notice potential security problems. How does this work? Well, if you feed that untrusted data and you pass it through the function, Angular is not going to protect you. So in this example, giving it the data from before will actually give you that pop-up. 
because by the function bypass security, you can tell Angular, this snippet is safe. I vouch for the safety of this snippet. So Angular's like, oh, in that case, I'm not going to do anything. Go ahead. And in this case, it ends up in a bad location. So this is intended for static code snippets. If you want to output a stat static code snippet, something you wrote yourself based on a certain condition, then sure, you can use this. But don't ever, ever use this for untrusted data. User-provided input should never pass through this function because you're going to cause cross-site scripting problems. Third guideline, don't use raw DOM APIs. So there are ways to get access to raw DOM elements with element refs. Don't use these APIs to output data into the DOM. Don't set attributes or content with those values because Angular is not in the loop anymore. The moment you get the raw DOM element and start calling APIs on that, Angular cannot protect you. Same thing if you add something like jQuery to your application to do something outside of Angular with jQuery, that's a very bad idea because jQuery uh, requires a lot of internal knowledge to prevent cross-site scripting vulnerabilities because they do a lot of crazy things with the values that you give it. So don't do that. Stick to the Angular way of doing things. Very, very important guideline here. And a final guideline to avoid cross-site scripting here is don't give the user control over resource URLs. Resource URLs are the only place where you need to think about security yourself because Angular cannot protect you there. Let, let me give you an example of a resource URL. Dynamically loading an iframe. The SRC here, this value will automatically trigger the loading of a document the moment you set it. There's no clicking in between, there's nothing in between, it simply triggers that loading immediately. So Angular, if you give it a, a URL like this, it will load a YouTube video. Very easy, very straightforward. However, if you give it data like that, it's gonna pop up an alert dialog. I know, why on earth can you put a JavaScript URL in an iframe SRC to pop up I, I don't know why, but it works. Challenge here is that Angular can't really protect you. Yes, they could determine that you probably don't want to do this. Probably. You shouldn't, but do you want to load YouTube videos? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Do you want to load stuff? What if this value comes from the user and it says like evil.example.com slash hackme.html? Do you want to load that? Probably not, but I don't know, maybe. So Angular can't really decide that for you. Angular doesn't really know what to do here, so it's going to give you an error by default. It's going to say, like, hold on, no, no, no. No, no. I'm going to, I know you want to set this, but I don't know whether this value is safe or not. Please ensure that it's safe first. Tell me it's safe, and then I'll put it into the page. That's essentially how this message, message translates here. And that means that you have to write some code. So you have to write a function or a way to tell Angular, like, hey, this resource URL is trusted. That's the line here. Bypass security, trust resource URL with this URL. Of course, before you call it, you better make damn sure that it's trusted, that you are sure it's a safe URL. So my recommendation here is never give the user full control over that URL. Because the moment you do that, it's going to be tricky. <coughs> tricky to secure, tricky to ensure it's safe. So if you fix the scheme, the host, and at least the path separator or even a path, then you fix the host where the request is going to. That way you are entirely sure this request is only going to www.youtube.com. And then you give the user control over the untrusted part, the identifier, you merge that into the URL and you're good to go. And then my recommendation here is as a defense and debt mechanism, run it through the default URL sanitizer. The one Angular uses when you put hrefs to an Angular tag, use that to ensure that in case something really crazy happens that Angular is still in the loop to say like, no, no, no. I don't think this is safe, so I'm not going to allow that URL to be used. And this way, you can actually ensure that that resource URL is safe, and you can put it into the page, and Angular will load it at that point. Awesome. Final word on this, use AOT. It's going to be available in development mode automatically from uh, the next version. We heard that in the keynote this morning, which is definitely recommended, because it prevents some weird template injection attacks that existed in Angular 1, uh, where there was no uh, compilation of template code up front. I'm not going to go into detail here, detail here just use it. Uh, there's a lot of benefits, and one of them is security. And that brings me to the first takeaway. That's a message I've been teaching a lot of developers in training courses when we talk about Angular. Uh, well, I talk about multiple frameworks, so the message for Angular is it's actually very easy, just stick to these simple rules. It's a bit messier for other frameworks, but sure. So automatically applies XSS defenses, so that's good. All you need to do is follow the Angular way of doing things. Don't try to fight Angular, don't try to bypass it, just do things as Angular expects, and you're good to go. All right, one down. The next topic 
is called broken authentication in the OWASP top 10, which is a very generic way of saying everything that has to do with users and session management kind of thing is messy and problematic. So yeah, there's a lot of vulnerabilities there. I'm going to be fairly brief here. I'm going to sketch the landscape, and I'm going to give you some advice and point you to further resources um, right after this talk. So we're mainly dealing with user authentication here. You want to authenticate users. And authentication, well, we all know passwords. We all hate passwords, probably, but we know them, and all our users know them as well. But the authentication landscape is insanely complicated. It has gotten really complex in the last five to 10 years. We have attacks like brute forcing. We have attacks like credential stuffing, where you take uh, leaked credentials from other websites and try them out against your applications. We have time-based attacks. All of these are insanely complicated to stop. Password policies, um, account registration, account recovery, and all of that is a lot of effort to build. On top of that, you have multi-factor authentication today with awesome things like YubiKeys, and that means that you'll have to implement support for that in your application as well. And all of that, I can guarantee you, you don't do that in a couple of days. That is months and months of effort. And even then, it's going to be really hard to get that thing secure. So my recommendation today is don't do it. Don't build it. Well, you need some security, so don't throw it all overboard. But offload that to an identity provider. Use something like OpenID Connect, which allows you to have your Angular application rely on an identity provider, and that identity provider will be responsible for handling all of that. If you use login with Google, awesome. Google will be responsible for handling all of that, and you just have to call them, and you get some result back, and you're good to go. Of course, you don't have to do this with a public identity provider. You can easily use products internally as well. You can buy identity provider products. You can deploy open source solutions. And you have cloud-based services you can use as well, which can be private to your applications. So there's a lot of options here, and it's really, really recommended to go that route, because implementing all of that is really complicated. Honestly, you don't want to be spending your time on that anymore today. If you're using OIDC in combination, you're typically going to use that in combination with OAuth. And now we're entering into a landscape which is insanely complex as well, figuring out how to use OAuth and how to use OIDC and what the right properties and the flows are. And I'm not going to talk about that in detail. There's a session right after mine about authentication in Angular. If you want to know more, go there. I don't know what's going to be covered because I'm going to be in the audience as well. Um, but it's, uh, it's probably highly recommended. They're from Out0. They should know what they're talking about. I want, just want to set a few things straight about OAuth and OIDC. So what you have here is you have the user is authenticating to the identity provider. So if this is login with Google or your internal system, doesn't matter. The user is only authenticating to that system. One place, one place only. If you're building an Angular app, the user is going to interact with your app. And if it's a front-end app only, if you don't have your own backend, if you're using like Google APIs or whatever APIs, then your app is going to be receive an identity token. So the user is actually authenticating to the front-end application, which is kind of meaningless. So you can't really authenticate to a front-end, but at least the front-end knows who the user is, and that user is authenticated at the identity provider. And then the front-end can access a couple of APIs, and it's going to do that with OAuth-based access tokens. So OpenID Connect is all about authenticating to an application, to the front-end in this example, and OAuth is about accessing APIs or resources on behalf of the user. And these are merged together, but also separate concepts. So don't use identity tokens to access APIs, because they're not intended to do that. They're supposed to be accessed with OAuth access tokens, which you can get during the same flow. So while you're authenticating, you can get access tokens as well and access APIs. For example, for Google, if you build an Angular front end to manage some Google uh, spreadsheet data, for example, you can ask the user to log in with Google, ask permission to access spreadsheets, and you will get an identity token and an access token. So you know, like, hey, welcome, Philip, and you can access that spreadsheet with that token instead. That would be one way of doing things. Another way would be if you have your own backend. If you have your own backend application, your Angular app is, again, what the user will interface with, and the Angular app is going to interface with your own backend. In that case, the user is authenticating to your backend application. The user is now going uh, to the identity provider, logging in as Philip with the identity provider, and your backend will now know, like, oh, the user that authent authenticated was Philip with user ID something something. And the backend can now link that to an internal user. Like, if it's a messaging form, like, oh, this user on the form is actually uh, dolphins are great. Cool. Um, now we know that dolphins are great authenticated, and we can link that to the data we have internally. 
Again, the identity is used here to authenticate against the backend application. And the backend can again access APIs on behalf of the user if they want to, and they would use OAuth access tokens for that. So these are two very different use cases. They require the use of different flows in these protocols. Uh, but if you have more questions about that, I'd be happy to talk about that later in the expert zone after lunch. But broken authentication recommendations today, which I always think if developers and most companies have been moving in the direction, is use OpenID Connect because you don't want to be implementing this yourself. For accessing resources on behalf of the user, use OAuth 2. That's what it's designed for. You can use both together in a very easy, streamlined fashion, so that's pretty awesome. You don't have to implement many of the dirty details yourself. You can use libraries for that. We have libraries available that support all of these features, so use them. They're highly recommended. I gave you one example on the slides before, and you can find many more online. By the way, if you want to grab a copy of the slides later, they're available on my Twitter feed. You'll find a link, and you can grab them from there as well. All right. One more. The last one is about using vulnerable components in your application. That's a problem. And especially in Angular, it's a real problem, because over 97% of applications are dependent, of application code are dependencies nowadays. 97% of your code or your application is code you are pulling in from the internet. And I know that 97% is like, that seems like a lot. So how much is it really? Well, I ran the numbers a while ago. If you generate a new clean Angular application with that command, it's going to ask you some questions. Like, do you want routing? Like, yeah, sure we want. And you want to use some uh, SAS or whatever? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, it's going to run npm install in the background, so it's going to take a while. <laughs> but after about 30 seconds, it's going to come back and say, like, yeah, we installed 1,169 packages from 1,030 contributors. Like, yeah, that's, that's kind of a lot. So you're now running code from 1,000 developers. That's impressive. But how much is that really? Well, let's count the lines of code. There's an npm module to count the lines of code. So you install that npm module. And then you can start counting lines of code. You'll find a lot of languages in there. But the interesting part is you'll find that you're now including 2,336,228 lines of code. This is a real number. This puts things into context. We're building a new Angular app. We have written zero lines of code, yet our application is 2,336,228 lines of code. That's what we're talking about here. That's a lot of code. That's a lot of code you're trusting on to not be vulnerable. Because this, this is built by developers, a lot of them free or volunteer developers, freelancers, people doing this for the, out of the good of their heart. And they all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. So one of these mistakes can be a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Oops. One of these mistakes can be God knows what. That can happen. So what if that happens in one of these dependencies? Then it's a problem for that library. They can update that. But now your, your program, your application is also vulnerable because you have that dependency with that vulnerability. So you'll need to update that. And this is something that will go on and go on like that. And that's only about legitimate mistakes, accidental vulnerabilities. This ecosystem is under a lot of attack lately because this is a very lucrative attack vector. Let me, let me tell you one example story. It's not necessarily an Angular story. It was uh, an addition to our re the React ecosystem, but it doesn't matter because it can happen to anyone. Let me explain to you what happened. There's a company uh, called uh, Commodo, I think. They, they built um, a product to manage your cryptocurrency in a wallet. Very, very sensitive. That's real money. Depends on what day it is, how much money, but you kind of get the idea. And the attacker, in this case, went, it was an open source application, they went to GitHub and they said like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if the application was an Electron app running on the desktop, if we would be able to use like native notifications, like the Mac OS notifications or the Windows notifications, that would be cool, right? And the product owners were like, yeah, actually that would be cool. And the attacker was like, do you want me to create a pull request for that? And they were like, uh, yes, please, do that. So the attacker went to work, he created a package called Electron Notify Native, 
which does exactly that. It allows to hook into that API from the operating system, and they published that on NPM, and they created a pull request using that library and added that to the application. And two days later, that was included by the target application. So we went, in about two weeks' time, we went from, hey, wouldn't this be cool to, here's a pull request, you can integrate that in your application. And everybody was happy, because it's a legitimate feature added by a volunteer, so awesome. That's, that's what makes the community beautiful, right? That's what we all depend on, and what we all hope is gonna happen in our community. And then, the attacker said, like, interesting. So, you have now included my dependency, and they updated their package to include malicious code. So they pushed out an update, they increased the version number, and they said, like, you know what? Now it's gonna do this notification plus a little bit extra. The little bit extra was not good extra, so. <laughs> it actually included code to steal the seeds from the wallets and publish them on a server somewhere so they could build up a database to get access to all of these wallets at the same time. A couple of weeks later, the target application, the wallet system in this case, included that dependency and deployed that. So at that moment, the malicious code started running, started collecting these seeds, publishing them on a server, and just waiting to grab all the money. This is bad. This is, this is a targeted attack against one application. The, there's a plot twist now. The good part is NPM tries to do as much as they can, and they actively scan libraries for potential malware. They have patterns to detect that. And they detected this, and they said, like, uh-oh, this is not good. And they contacted the company and said, like, yeah, we have a problem. And they looked at it and they said, like, yeah, we have a problem. Because the, li the, the, the seeds were already stolen, so the libraries, are the, the wallets were already accessible by the attacker if they decided to do so. And they eventually decided, like, what are we going to do with that? And this is real moving material here. They actually stole everybody's money using that vulnerability and put it in a safe location. So they transferred all the money to a safe location, out of reach for the attacker, and then they set up a whole process where users could reclaim their wallets through the proper procedures and get access to their money again. But this is to show you what we have to deal with today. Any of these dependencies in your application can become malicious at any time. Whether it's intentional or because of a mistake, or because someone breaking into NPM, into that specific account and publishing an update, all of that can really happen. And we need to be aware of that. And there's not much we can do against these active attacks, except be vigilant. There are a few things you can do in your applications, and you should set up dependency scanning today. Because there's a lot of these known vulnerabilities. We know that version X of library Y is vulnerable to this attack. But if you haven't updated your libraries in a while, then you might have that vulnerable version, but you don't even know that until you set up dependency scanning. GitHub has a free service, the dependency graph, and they scan your package or JSON or whatever you're using, and they tell you, like, these libraries are vulnerable. Update now, please. OWASP has a similar tool called Dependency Check. It can run in offline mode, supports a few different languages. Really awesome software. They just scan against known vulnerabilities and they fix or they tell you about that. And SNCC is a commercial company. They have something very similar with a lot of good features and they offer a free version for open source developers as well. So you need to be aware of this. You need to set up dependency scanning. It's really, really, really important that you do so so you can update your libraries as soon as possible. And that brings us back towards the beginning. So we talked about the top three. There's seven more if you want to collect them all. Um, some people like that. Talk to me at the expert zone, so I'll be happy to uh, go into depth into all of these topics. To wrap it up, I built an Angular security sheet sheet, uh, which you can grab from my website. So if you go there, or if you go to Twitter, you'll find that link as well. Uh, you can grab like a nice overview of things to watch out for in Angular applications. And with that, I have zero time left, so I'm going to wrap it up, and I'm going to thank you for being here. Follow me on Twitter for more security news, and talk to me at the conference while I'm around. Thanks very much, Philip. So there's lots there for us to look at, and like Philip said, you can catch them in the expert zone later this afternoon. So next up on track one, we have the science of authenticating Angular apps, like Philip said. Here, you can find out more about um, Manu's journey on the Angular team. Thanks very much and see you in five minutes. Welcome to Angular Connect 2018. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online.
it again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment, stack blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Hi, and welcome back. So up next, we've got Manu, who's gonna talk to us about his journey on the Angular team. Let's hear it for Manu. Thank you. Hey, folks. I'm uh, Manu Murthy. I manage technology programs and uh, help organizations realize their strategic goals. Um, today, I'm going to share with you some real stories from my journey on the Angular team, uh, experiences I've had, and uh, lessons I've learned that you can apply to your own projects. Uh, by way of a quick introduction, uh, I'm a program management leader. I joined Google and the Angular team in October 2017. Uh, prior to that, uh, I've led large programs at Apple, Hewlett Packard. I'm passionate about web development in general and agile methods. Um, outside work, I'm a landscape photographer and enjoy traveling to different places and capturing stunning landscapes. Before I talk about my journey, uh, I'd like to take a few minutes and describe why I joined the Angular team. One of the main reasons I joined the Angular team is the value system that Angular upholds. The team truly cares about building an inclusive environment, regardless of where you're from or uh, uh, who you are, respect for each other, making everybody feel welcome to contribute and perform their best, and this is the core value system of Angular, and it makes me proud to be a part of that culture. Angular is also a complete framework. Uh, the use cases that are important to building web applications have been thought through end to end. 
uh, from animations to building native language experiences to server-side rendering. With Angular, you can leverage those proven time-tested patterns and use them in your own apps. Angular is also life-changing. Um, people choose and see Angular as a career path for themselves. And I was talking to a gentleman yesterday, and uh, he said he speaks three languages, Hindi, which is his mother tongue from India, English, and Angular. Another person told me, and I quote, uh, your team creates what I use, unquote. And having that kind of profound impact on people's lives um, is truly amazing. Angular also has an active and vibrant community uh, and support system. Um, you have a question, there are a lot of places you can turn to for help. Uh, Stack Overflow, there's several online forums. You feel truly supported with Angular. And last but not the least, the super awesome team that I have the pleasure of working with every single day. Um, these are some random pictures I captured during my time uh, with these amazing people. Uh, here's a picture from a pizza movie uh, social that we had a few weeks ago. Uh, the Angular team works really hard, and we also play hard. Um, I also wanted to paint a timeline of my journey thus far. Um, I've worked on three major releases, version 6 of Angular 7 as well as version 8. Looking forward to version 9 and many more to come. I've also worked on several minor releases and patch releases. Um, and the experiences that I'll be sharing today are from this time period. All right, let's jump right in. Story number one, keeping up with the ecosystem. The world does not stop. Uh, the ecosystem is constantly evolving. And that creates the need to plan for change. There are key dependencies that we update for you with every release of Angular, um, such as TypeScript, RxJS, ZoneJS. Um, these are peer dependencies in your package JSON. So for example, doing an ng update Angular core will update all of the Angular framework packages, as well as RxJS, TypeScript. It will also run any schematics on those packages to keep you up to date. Let me quote an example from version 6. Uh, RxJS version 6 released prior to Angular version 6. It was a very significant release with a lot of major changes that we had to integrate with. We also automatically installed the RxJS Compat package uh, into your application as part of the update to make the adoption of RxJS version 6 smoother. While all of this eventually came to fruition, the scope of RxJS and the user experience uh, was unclear till very late in the project. Also, RxJS Compat took several iterations to build uh, than we had anticipated. And the Angular team just underestimated the complexity of this whole effort, um, of the seemingly straightforward effort. And it also put a lot of pressure on the Angular version 6 critical path for the project. Another example of keeping up with the ecosystem, uh, we were faced with a CLI memory issue, and this is from version 8. Uh, we had moved from node 10 over to node 12 in version 8. And following that, we got reports from users that projects that were building correctly in the past uh, are now hitting the memory limit. And in some cases, the performance was worse, or the memory usage went up by 70%. We worked with the V8 team. So the V8 team is Google's open source JavaScript engine team, which is used in Chrome, Node.js, and so on. And we also worked with the node teams to get to the bottom of the issue. The V8 team actually built an instrumented version of V8 with a custom node version to get to deep diagnostics so we can troubleshoot the issue. We were able to isolate the issue uh, to a for loop in the AOT compiler. We were copying from a prototype while cloning objects. The practice was actually optimized in older versions, but with the new V8, uh, this was no longer supported, and so we had a problem. The fix eventually came down to a one-line change. Um, and we were able to get the performance back to where uh, it should be. But it actually took us a long time to get there. All right, so what are some of the key lessons uh, that we can take away from this experience? Think through your dependencies across your ecosystem and actually document them. Uh, plan time in your projects to actually deal with and update those dependencies. 5 to 10% of the time, if you have a more complex integration, obviously, you'd want to factor in more time. And this is something we do across the board at Google, because we have a mono repository, and we move together as a single unit. Also, try to front load your plans, and that way it will give you time to react to any unexpected findings later on. 
I also talked about documenting dependencies just a moment ago, and here's an example of a dependency matrix um, that we developed for Angular. You see the three main repositories, framework components and tooling, and the different dependency items. We actually created this in version 6, and uh, we started using this for subsequent releases of Angular. It helps us understand the scope of the work, um, track it, and uh, keeps us sane. Story number two. Does how you do stuff matter? So process is an area which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, process describes how things are done and provides the focus for making things better. In late 2017, um, there was a lack of process focus in the Angular team. Uh, the processes we had were not scalable enough to meet Angular's ongoing you know, growth. And it was also really hard to answer simple questions such as, are you on track or off track on a given day? Um, what's the level of risk to your critical path of your project? Are people working on the right set of priorities? So fundamental questions were actually really hard to answer. One of the biggest lessons my team and I learned is the reality of project plans. The plan is really your best guess of how you think the project will proceed, as top part of this picture shows. And in reality, it's quite different as the bottom part of the picture shows. So we wanted to build a process that helps build a plan that is adaptable. So we started on a process transformation journey, and uh, we wanted to stay focused on a few things as we did that. Uh, things that truly impact the end user satisfaction. Things that are executed often, think of it as the 20-80 rule, 20% 20 of things that get executed 80% of the time. We want to focus on those things. We wanted to make sure they're measurable. And most importantly, we wanted the process to be lean and essentially stay out of the way. So the transforma this is the transformation that happened between late 2017 and today. So previously, we had a mixed hybrid model of waterfall as well as scrum, so I call it scrum fall. Uh, we had very basic project management tools, aka spreadsheets, as well as documentation. There was lack of execution metrics, um, things that you can use to assess the health of your projects. And there was also lack of regular you know, introspection retrospectives. And uh, triage and dealing with technical debt was happening on a best effort basis. Versus today, uh, we made some improvements. We actually use Kanban and Scrum. Why do we have a different model? Uh, and some of the functional areas, the requirements are evolving very rapidly that you can freeze within the scope of a sprint. So we use Kanban. And in other cases where you can fix life for a week or two, uh, sprint duration, we actually use Scrum. Uh, we have also standardized on our Agile tool set. We use Jira. We use GitHub projects. We are tracking metrics, uh, such as velocity blockers burned down. But um, we're not really using them to drive decision making. That's something I would like to do in the future. But we have them. Uh, we also have a regular cadence for monthly sub-team retrospectives. Um, we also do twice a week triaging of bugs. I'll talk about that a little bit later. We also have a scrum of scrums where the functional leads from each of the areas uh, get together. We talk about interdependencies and really anything that's cross-cutting. And we also do tech teams, uh, tech talks, excuse me. Um, All right, we also have a set of guiding key performance indicators that we use to understand the health of Angular as a product. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but uh, some of the things we look at is the Hello World bundle size. We look at the Angular IO bundle size. We look at the traffic on our docs website. We look at analytics for CLI, opt-in. Uh, we look at continuous integration time for the PRs, pull requests. And we also run benchmarks for build and runtime performance. At the end of the day, methodology is an aid to thinking. It's not a substitute. Um, there isn't a silver bullet. The important thing is to understand the key questions you and your stakeholders are trying to answer about the health of the program and develop a methodology that actually helps you with that. Story three, own debt before it owns you. Um, Debt is a very important consideration, but unfortunately, it's also the most forgotten one. And um, we on the Angular team are guilty of the same. So debt can broadly be classified into technical debt as well as bug debt. Uh, you may have a different definition of uh, technical versus bug debt. I think for the purposes of this conversation, let's define technical debt as what you incur. 
These are shortcuts you take with the code, poor design choices you make, uh, band-aids you put in, things like that. Bug debt, on the other hand, is functional and non-functional deficiencies and deviations that happen. Okay? It's actually less important what you call it. The more important thing is actually how you prioritize and deal with it. Best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, and the second best time is now. So in the context of the conversation here today, this means that if you want success and growth in the future, the best time to act on debt is right now. Um, so what are some of the lessons we learned along the journey, right? So accruing debt is bad. Not paying it down is worse, because if you fail to pay your debt down, then you actually, you're paying the interest on the debt every time you interact with the code. Try to allocate 5 to 10% of your project time um, to tackle this. It's hard, trust me. Uh, and it's an area me and my team are trying to do a better job at. And I will continue to push for debt management in my role uh, as program manager for Angular. Um, here's a bug triage process we actually use on the Angular team. Uh, triage essentially means how you categorize and prioritize the issues so you can actually focus on what is important. The issues go through two levels of triage. Um, they basically, we basically identify the functional issues, and we also identify the seriousness of the issue. Once triaged, we are able to see the overall priorities on this homegrown dashboard that we've developed. This helps us prioritize the work in relation to all the other pieces of work that we have to do. Uh, this is not a prescriptive solution. This is just how we do it on the Angular team. Uh, there is a lot of scope for improvement, and this is constantly evolving. The key takeaway here is that have a process and act on that process often to tackle your debt. Story four, what the smoosh happened. So there's a proposal for the JS language feature, which is array prototype flatten, which actually turns out to be web incompatible. And specifically, there was a MoTools library which was being used by several websites. And the proposal author jokingly suggested renaming Flatten to Smoosh um, to tackle the problem. The joke wasn't clear to everyone, and things escalated pretty quickly. So my good friends in RxJS took this opportunity to create an April Fool's joke uh, by converting all the major merge operators to their Smoosh counterparts. They then pushed out RxJS 6, smoosh.0 on NPM, and then a message pops up. Since you published this on NPM, and caret 6 RC0 resolves to smoosh, you are now breaking people. I recommend that you unsmoosh it by publishing you know, a smoosh one that removes the breaking change. The issue was fixed, but the key lesson here is that consider the impact and consequences. Um, seemingly harmless stuff like this can have a negative impact, and sometimes the impact is reputation impacting. We're also exploring deeper continuous integration uh, to alleviate the stress and gray hairs, stuff like this causes. Story number five, infrastructure as an afterthought. In the past, uh, dev infrastructure on the Angular team was everybody's problem, so in effect, it was nobody's problem. So there was a lack of accountability, and uh, the team didn't fully understand or appreciate the impact and complexity of dev infrastructure in general. We also had a lot of flakiness with the infrastructure, and uh, we were patching those things, or we were band-aiding those things to solve the moment's problem rather than systematically fixing it. And what that does is it increases the amount of debt you have. And this rolls up not just to Angular, but also the entire community, and affects everybody who's trying to submit a PR. So we also embarked on this dev infrastructure transformation effort. Uh, we formed a sub-team, we nominated a lead, and uh, planned for a one-year horizon with regards to you know, what things we want to fix. Here's some of the recent work on the uh, dev infrastructure uh, front that we have been doing. Now, uh, Joey Perot from my team will actually be talking about these things in more detail. Uh, he's got a talk coming up, um, and I think it's titled uh, GitHub at Scale. So if you want more information about these things, I suggest you tune into his talk. But in terms of what we've actually implemented, we have uh, done remote build execution to fan out the builds 
and this improves the speed and cost efficiency for us. We also take care of caching. Um, Basil allows to do this um, and gives us the incrementality. And we've also established several benchmarks and tracking for local rebuilds, continuous integration rebuilds, test, response times, so on. And we've also put a lot of emphasis on Windows CI. Story six, finding leaders. As Angular grew, we had to reorganize ourselves to be able to scale better to the, needs of the, uh, to the growing needs of the community. We also needed a better system of accountability and we also wanted to align with the process transformation work that I was alluding to earlier. We created various sub-teams and assigned technical leads. Uh, this helped provide the focus and uh, particularly helped us manage interdependencies across these subsystems better. This is how Angular is organized. The top portion of the pyramid, uh, we have the Angular Google team. We've just talked about the sub-teams that were formed and how we organized uh, you know, Angular on that front. The bottom part of this triangle is the user base in the community. And as Angular is a very active community, this is growing faster, much faster than the top of the pyramid. So how do you keep up with that? And how do you scale to meet that growing demand? This is where the middle section of the pyramid comes in. And uh, we're talking about community collaborators and enterprise collaborators. These are people who have demonstrated high quality work um, and code, documentation, helping others in the community, filing an awesome bug report, they're all valid forms of contributions. Uh, these folks have a mentor assigned on the team and they have the formal support to make contributions to Angular. So these are the eight amazing people we onboarded recently as community collaborators and these folks have made incredible contributions to Angular. We have actually been very fortunate to find them and work closely with them, and these community leaders help us scale Angular better. In addition, we also have an amazing Google Expert Developers Program. We have about 105 uh, GDEs, uh, leaders, and uh, we also established an early access program which, uh, which is used for them to actually validate the releases before they actually reach the customer. So that's another level of quality check we've put in. In summer 2019, we had three amazing interns work on the Angular team as well. Uh, Alisa, Ayaz, and Alana. Angular receives hundreds of issue reports, pull requests each month from the community on GitHub. Alisa, one of our interns, built a dashboard that helps us process and streamline the whole process of managing pull requests more efficiently. This will ensure that important issues from the community do not fall through the cracks. Ayaz is also one of our interns, and he built a tool that searches through the Angular code and enables you to get access to semantic information about applications. And the work that he did was based on the Kite ecosystem for building um, language analysis tools. Ilana is one of our other interns who's also doing a talk here at Angular Connect um, today. And uh, she built a web portal for finding Angular components, uh, search for tools and libraries from the ecosystem. The results are curated, and you actually see the results along with metadata information, such as bundle size, um, any accessibility, and the presence of Angular-specific tools, such as ng add and compatibility. All right, in summary, uh, plan to keep up with the ecosystem. Have a process, you know, measure and continuously improve upon it, and how you do stuff actually matters. Burn down your debt and allocate the time to start doing that now. Uh, always consider the impact and consequences of stuff you do. Pay attention to infrastructure, plan infrastructure. Do not let it be an afterthought. And lastly, find leaders. They're out there, you just need to find them. Uh, I'll be posting the slides on my uh, Twitter account. Uh, thank you for joining me on this journey and have a wonderful rest of your conference. Thanks very much, Manu. That was really interesting, getting an insight into uh, the Angular team. So um, up next, if we can go to... 
Ah, oh, there we go. Community lunch. So um, we have the community lunch starting now, which is um, we're about roughly on time. So um, it'll be lasting at the full hour of lunchtime. So you can go down to the mini workshop room and grab your lunch there and join other community members. Welcome to Angular Connect 2018. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out.
Tech 2018. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment, stack blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. 
experiment stack blades uh, angular CLI it's super easy and it's super fun ask those questions so you can get more information out Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out.
2018. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment, stack blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. 
experiment, stack blitz, uh, angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out.
Olympic 2018. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment, stack blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. 
it again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment, stack blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun.
Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out.
2018. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you're just interacting with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment, stack blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you're just interacting with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity. that you won't have when you're just interacting with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment, stack blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out.
Munich 2018. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment, stack blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. 
experiment, stack blitz, uh, angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out.
Angular Connect 2018. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment, stack blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out.
Hello, everybody. Wow. Oh. Hey, where are you? I can't see you. <laughs> okay. Wow. Hi. Um, I'm Shmuela, your host for uh, the following sessions, and I'm really happy to be here. How about you? Yeah. How was lunch? Is it good? It was tasty, right? It was good. Oh, the, the desserts. Oh, my God. And um, uh, so I, ha I hope you also enjoyed lunch and, uh, um, and enjoyed the conference so far, right? And I hope you're going, um, we're going to have a fantastic afternoon. And um, let's uh, start. So the first thing that we're going to do now is the Slido. Uh, who has heard about Slido this morning? Okay, great. So we're going to do a quick questions now. Which country are you from? So you just log into slido.com and uh, enter the code Angular Connect, and we want to see which country you're from. And we're doing this also in the other session, and we're going to see the results live in a few seconds. Wow. Look at that. So a lot of you are from the United Kingdom. <laughs> but it seems like more from Germany? Could it be? Yeah? Who's here from Germany? OK. Yeah. And who's from London? Yeah. <laughs> Where else? What else do we see here? The Netherlands, Scotland, Bulgaria, Austria. What's the f furthest uh, place that you can see here? Where? Moon. The moon? Is there the moon? <laughs> Mars. <laughs> wow. Oh my god. That's so great. And we have, okay. Almost 400 people have answered it and keep answering. Great. So we've got a, a, a good data set here. Great. We can work with that. <laughs> um, all right. And um, now uh, the next uh, thing that we're doing, you're going to submit uh, your questions on Slido. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So now if you, you've already opened Slido, right? So uh, think about a question that you want to ask the panel for tomorrow afternoon. All right? That's what you're doing now. Awesome. And next on, uh, we have uh, a great sponsor uh, that's sponsoring this uh, wonderful, wonderful conference. Progress. Is there anyone here who hasn't heard about con uh, progress? Come on. Yeah. So. Everybody knows progress, but Carl Berg Bergenham. Where are you, Carl? You're going to talk about progress and tell us what's new there. Thank you. Give a hand. <laughs> Carl. All right. Hey, everybody. Let me uh, wake up my laptop here. And as I type in my password incorrectly in front of everybody multiple times, it's going to be a great deal of embarrassment. There we go. Uh, so my name is Carl Bergenham, and I'm the product manager for Kendo UI. Some of you might have heard about Kendo UI. You might have actually talked to me. I actually see some familiar faces as I'm scanning through uh, the room here. But uh, the reason that uh, we're here today is because of Kendo UI for Angular, which is a set of native UI components built from the ground up specifically for Angular. And I wanted to just quickly open up our demo page to give you an idea of what I'm talking about when I'm referring to UI components. And uh, really, you can see a lot of it here, where we're covering everything that you might need for more advanced components, like uh, data grid, uh, scheduler components, similar to what you might find in a Google Calendar or at your Outlook Calendar, uh, into rich text editing, data visualization, charts, graphs, gauges, all that good stuff. And then into some of the more basic elements, like buttons, input elements, uh, maybe drop-downs, date pickers, all that good stuff, all contained with 
within one single library, and we tend to say that we're not opinionated. So in terms of design languages, right, uh, maybe a good example is uh, going over the button real quick. We actually integrate with multiple different design languages, so we have our own design language out of the box. Uh, we also have a material theme that you can see right here. And then in this resolution, let me see if I can open up the Bootstrap theme. Uh, we also have the Bootstrap theme available out of the box. So with these three, we're hoping that rather than try to force you to go with our design language, you can integrate with your favorite one. So if you're using Angular Material today and just need to augment it a little bit with our components, uh, you can easily do so by just dropping them on the page, take advantage of our SAS variables to be able to line up the color scheme, and you're good to go. Uh, just as some quick examples, what we have here is our grid, which provides a lot of the functionality that you need out of the grid, out of the box. So uh, we have paging, sorting, filtering, grouping. I could, for example, drag uh, by this column header and create uh, some quick groups for us. We have multi-column headers, and we have a ton of interactivity, and also we have a big focus on performance. So we do virtualization across the board, so column or row virtualization within uh, the grid for heavy data entry. Uh, we also do the same thing within our dropdowns and a couple of other components. And another component that we, I can chat about real quick here is our scheduler component, which provides you with a very similar interface to what you might be dealing with within Outlook or Google Calendar, as I mentioned. Uh, so you can have something like an all-day event that stays there as I scroll through. Uh, I can also double-click on one of these elements, and we should see a uh, pop-up up here, hopefully, uh, unless I mess something up with the demo. But uh, that provides you with a way to do something like uh, recurrence editing and just editing your event information. Uh, we also have the ability to go into a more like a timeline view or even an agenda view, where you can set up different resources and have it uh, be arranged by those particular resources, whether those are people or rooms or whatever it might be. Uh, and then, uh, just quickly, I also wanted to show off our uh, rich text editor, which is, of course, exciting. You can do a ton of good stuff like you might, for example, do in Word that you might want to inject into your applications, get your users out of Word and Excel, all these applications to kind of uh, shove them into your applications instead. Uh, so. Uh, if you are interested in talking a little bit more, I have myself and some of my engineers over by the Progress booth right outside. Uh, I also just want to mention that everything that you see here is free and fully functional to try out. We have a 30-day trial that allows you to get access not only uh, to the components, which you have access to as long as you need to, but also access to our support ticketing system, which allows you to actually chat live with our developers if you need any help or anything like that. So I believe that's all of my time. Thank you again. I appreciate it, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Carl, and thank you, Progress, again. Uh, so, our next talk. Um, the speakers are two good friends of mine, and uh, they're both GDs and both very involved in the Angular community. Uh, Uri Shaked is, um, a, a, he, well, he regularly writes a blog post a lot about Angular and also other things like IoT. I remember that he had a challenge uh, a year ago about writing a, a blog post uh, once a day. Is that right, Uri? <laughs> Are you still doing that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. It, it, yeah, it's a, it's a great challenge. And um, uh, among other things, uh, <laughs> yeah, I have my notes. Hey. Um, and he's uh, he's also interested in all in some of the of some other technologies uh, like um, virtual and uh, augmented reality and hardware hacking and neuroscience, building 3D printed robots and uh, games, uh, playing music. And is there something that you don't do? <laughs> hmm? You don't go to the gym, but you do. You don't go to the gym, but you do dance salsa, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And Dominic, Dominic Elm, um, he's a trainer at Thoughtram, uh, teaches Angular, and he's a software developer at Stack Blitz, and. Um, and he's also uh, working on some uh, really interesting. Uh, a open source projects. I have them written here. Uh, Angular Checklist, which is a curated list of best practices for your application. And he's a co-creator also of NGX Template Streams. 
uh, which is bringing more reactivity to Angular templates. And he also enjoys hiking and biking and a lot of other stuff in his free time. Uh, do you have free time, Dominic? <laughs> no, no more than that. Okay, so uh, for the next talk, I'm so happy to invite you to uh, give a hand to Dominic Elm and Uri Shaked. So, hello. Uh, thank you, Shmuela. Do you see my screen? No. Let's do, whoo, now you see my screen. It's alive. Yeah. It's alive, what's alive? We're alive. I we guess are alive we're on the stage. In great times where hopefully machine learning can write code for us, or as you will discover soon, so we thought. Shmuela did some uh, spoilers, so, uh, we won't go over this again, but uh, Dominic and I met here in Angular Connect last year. We attended a very interesting talk. Um, do you recognize this guy? I think I recognize him. If I look very closely, I can mm -hmm. see, I think his name is Asim. That's at Angular Connect last year, almost like one year ago. And uh, well, it looks like, I don't know, you probably know him from some of the projects he did. Can he you remember what that project was about? Yeah, he showed a lot of exciting demos with machine learning. One of them was, for example, taking a photo and running it through an algorithm that will tell you what the emotion uh, conveyed in that photo is, and then replacing that photo's presence face with an emoji, the emoji fire. <laughs> worked quite well. Yeah, it worked well. And he also had another interesting concept. Uh, can you tell us? Yeah, so uh, he talked about AI and JavaScript, and then there were a couple of examples. But one example that really, um, that we remember well was this form, right? So um, the goal was to generate an HTML form by just putting in a description of that form. So we could say, hey, um, we want to have an input field and two checkboxes and a radio button and all these things. And then automatically, what's going to happen is it will generate that form for us. Isn't that insane? But guess what happened next? He released it as open source? No, not quite. So I don't know. Click the submit button. Let's and do then it. Then YouTube loaded. <laughs> he fooled everybody. So I guess we're not here for dancing, but right. this song is called Never Gonna Give You Up. So we're never gonna give up on that. So it's not yet possible, but um, we're getting there. Thank you, Asim. Everybody, a big <laughs> for Asim for inspiring us to do this talk. Because without him, we wouldn't be on this stage, so we had a lot of inspiration from the theme. So, yeah, thank you. And after his talk, we sat together and started brainstorming. How could we bring this into reality? What could we do? And we had a couple of ideas, like uh, sketching an app on a notebook, scanning it, and generating code out of that. But eventually, we had one idea that clicked. <coughs> Exactly, and so we went with this idea of automatically generating code for us. Basically, well, taking away our job because that's our job, writing code, right? So um, what we thought is, given a function signature, and that's what we see there, we pass it into this black box that we call model, right? And then we wanted to pre predict the implementation of this function, and in this uh, case, it's just adding A and B together. So that's what we wanted the model to to do, so basically, all. given the uh, start of a function, write a function. Yeah. And what's the thing in the middle, the model? Can you explain a bit? Yeah, so this model, we don't have to dive all the details, but you can think of this model, this black box, as, um, as a JavaScript-ish function, which has one input um, that could be anything. Right? We pass in some input, it does some computational magic, we don't have to worry about that magic, um, and then it returns an output. That's what this model does. So basically, it's magic. It is magic. But the thing is, we don't have to implement this computational magic ourselves. We let the machine figure out the implementation of this function. So that's what machine learning is all about, it getting is. the uh, content of that magic model function figured out. Exactly. All right, so uh, speaking of magic, can you hold this bulb for me? I can. I don't know what's going to happen. That's machine learning. 
Well, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Machine learning doesn't work. Yeah, we'll try that again. <laughs> it's broke. <laughs> we'll try that again later. Anyway, so... Um, so you might be like this, right? We've just seen that uh, generating an HTML, HTML form from description is not really possible, so you might be like, oh, come on. Stop fooling, fooling us. It's, it's not possible. But... We actually went ahead and tried this, and we gave a talk about it a few months ago in a great conference called NG Vikings. And you will be able to see in a moment what it looked like in that talk. We tried it live, and well, did it's it a work? glimpse. So right. let's have a look. Hopefully, the the audio works. Yeah, yeah. You, you were really surprised by the implementation of ad. Like, I wouldn't say it's the most straightforward implementation you would come up with. Well, I can see flush after it kind of subtracts A from B. It well, could be adding, adding numbers. It's, it's very it's creative, big, I would yeah. say. Well, not a, but yeah, the model got really creative. It did manage to create like a valid code, which is quite amazing, and. Very creative indeed. And after this talk, we were uh, excited and we summarized our learning. So first of all, as you probably uh, have, you just had a glimpse, but we learned that automatic code generation is hard, right? Right. And also what we learned is that data processing, um, we talked about this a lot in our talk at NG Vikings, so you can check it out. Um, but data processing, that includes cleaning, gathering the data, and all that, and all those things, that makes up a huge chunk of the work. It is really a lot of percentage of that entire work just focusing on the data, because data is so important for machine learning. And basically, we really loved working with machine learning. We found it hard, difficult, but fascinating. And we decided to give it another go. This time, we had a different goal, though. We decided uh, to think, what else can we do with code? I could think of a couple of things. Um, but let's not try to take away our job. Let's try and create this synergy between us and machines. Like, I have an idea. Do you like to write comments? Like, do you write comments? Well, do you people I write have comments? to, but who I write don't like comments? It. Who likes to write comments? Who likes to write them? I see a couple. Oh. Well, there's someone that's good for you. <laughs> wow. So uh, you can come and work with our machine learning model together. <laughs> for the rest of us, uh, we decided to try to, again, given a function, this time the entire function, just predict what the comment would be. Have this model function. Uh, return us the comment for that function. That is great. I mean, that really makes our lives as developers much easier. So we don't have to document our code. We just have this model which generates the comments for us and summarizes the code. That is fantastic. Right. Does it work? So we also had another goal before we're going to show if it worked. We decided that this time we're going to use machine learning with JavaScript. Because traditionally, machine learning is done in other languages, such as Python. And then if you want to take your machine learning models and use them uh, everywhere, basically on the web or in OGS, um, it's not very straightforward if they are written in Python. Python doesn't run on the web. So we decided to try and use JavaScript this time. We'll tell you about it in a bit. So the process, the general process looks like this. Um, we start by gathering data. We need a lot of data. Like? A lot. Like how much? Well, maybe 300,000 of, of examples, or even a million of examples. So it's a lot of data. And then I see we need to clean it and prepare it. So yes. it's easy for the model to find out um, how to approach code. Like, uh, And then we need to train the model. Exactly. But this is basically what we've talked about already at NG Vikings. But for this talk, as we know, we wanted to add this layer of JavaScript to it right. to make it a little bit more practical for us so that we can consume those. So what we did is we added another layer to this. So taking a trained model, we're going to see what this looks like, and then somehow use TensorFlow.js to consume it in JavaScript. So TensorFlow, that is a machine learning library for uh, 
Python, but it has a special property. There are also versions for JavaScript, for Android, for iOS. So a bit like Angular, it's universal. Yes. You can run your models anywhere. You can create them in Python, run them in JavaScript. Exactly. And then once we have it in, 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 the, in the JavaScript world, we can then use the tools that we use, such as Visual Studio Code, right, mm -hmm. which is awesome. And then we can create an extension for it so that we can consume the model in an, in, an, in an extension and then predict the comment. All right, so let's start with gathering the data. We need, you said like... A lot of it. A lot of comments. So uh, we have like 500 people in the audience. If everybody writes comments for us, how long would it take us? Do you perhaps have a better idea how can we get a lot of comments? GitHub. 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 Yeah, so uh, yeah. can you go on GitHub and just download? Uh, well, I know what I typically do is, well, there's this download button. So yeah. I can just go through all the repositories and click that download button. Can like I? Hundreds, thousands of time. It, well, it's going to take me a while, but sure. I have a better way to do it. Mm. Let me show you. So there is this thing called BigQuery. It's a large scale data warehouse from Google with a lot of buzzwords in the name. But basically what it means, it can run queries, SQL queries on enormous amount of data really fast in a matter of seconds. Can you show me what that looks like? Yeah, so it also ha happens that BigQuery has the entire open source code from GitHub as a data set that we can query. And let me take you to my uh, laptop where I can show you BigQuery in action. Oops, spoiler. Uh, another spoiler. Yeah. Um, so this is basically BigQuery, and uh, I have a query here. I'm going to run it in a moment. You can see it's going to, no, I didn't want developer tools. I wanted full screen. You can see it's going to process 2.3 gigabytes of source code when I run it. So I'm now clicking the run button, and now it's running in the cloud. Like, it's going to take one minute. So wait a second. Is that just SQL? So like yeah, the, you the can, SQL we would use for databases? You can recognize here some SQL elements mm -hmm. like select from or where, but BigQuery has this uh, interesting feature where you can also run JavaScript as part of your SQL query, as you can see above. So I love that. Basically, we are using the TypeScript compiler inside BigQuery to process all the source files, find all the methods and functions, and extract the comments and the bodies of the functions and methods. I see. So we use the TypeScript compiler, which you know, we, we, use, we take advantage of the AST to then find information we need from those files, such as the function and all these things. Right, and we do this like in the cloud really fast. It's going to finish in a few seconds. And uh, if you are not familiar with the AST abstract syntax tree, you can find it in a talk I gave uh, with the same title on Angular app. So we have the results. Let I table with basically the comments and the text. Some uh, oh, check if we should should it touch. Uh, let's go to the last page, see if there is anything interesting there. So basically we have here, um, yeah, basically we have here, uh, let me zoom in, we have here 300,000 comments in our data set. In just a minute. Yeah, wow, this is like really long comment. Oh, metodo que envía a filtro. This is uh, español. Hablas español. Oh, sí, yo hablo español muy bien. <laughs> so, yeah, so we have this uh, large data set now, this big JSON file with 300,000 uh, comments and functions. Are we ready? To no. No. No, okay. no, I'm going to stop you right there. We're not, we're not done yet. We have all the data. That's great. Um, but the next step is actually to clean the data because the data, well, it's text, right? And we have to do a couple of things. It's not as tidy as we want it to be. We have seen some comments in Spanish. Yes, exactly. And that's why the first step would be um, to turn everything into lowercase because we, don't, we want to remove the noise from the data set. We also remove URLs because that also just adds noise to the data set and has no added value, really. Um, we also remove non-English comments because we mm -hmm. know that already learning one language is difficult, right? And then learning all these languages would be even more difficult. 
And then also, again, to reduce the noise and complexity, we replace function names and arguments by just very generic placeholders. And we also do that uh, on an AST basis. So basically, the comments no longer contain the function names and the arguments. They just contain function name placeholder, argument one placeholder. So it's easier for the model to understand that a, word, a specific word in the comments is actually some of the, one of the uh, arguments of the function. And once we have done cleaning, we start cooking? Almost. It's, okay. like, it's like preparing dinner. So it's like a recipe, and you have certain steps and things you have to do, right? If you want to make a tomato soup, you have to you know, cut the tomatoes, and they have to be in a very specific shape for a tomato sauce or soup. So that's what preparing is all about. For instance, we have text. And obviously, machines, they don't work with text. Right. They work like very well with numbers. numbers. Exactly. So that's what we have to do. We have to take the text of the comment and convert it into a list of numbers. Uh, so we create some kind of a dictionary, like you would have an English dictionary, but in this case, it's not English to Spanish, it's English to numbers. And also the other way around, so it's both ways. So when we feed the input into the model, you, we use this dictionary to convert it to a list of numbers, and then when the model predicts a comment, we use the dictionary again to convert the numbers the model predicted into uh, text. That's right. That's right. So uh, are we ready to train it? No. Why not? Not yet. So we have to come up with a model architecture. There's a couple of things you can do. Um, but for training a model, you would typically use Python, as we already mentioned. And um, there's a library called TensorFlow, which lets you train and create these models. And you can think of TensorFlow as like this box which um, with um, a lot of Lego blocks. You can think of these blocks as Lego blocks. And you can just mix and match them and stack them on top of each other to build the model you need. But how do you know how to do this? Well, you would look at very similar problems. You like wouldn't start just from scratch. You just look at very similar problems from maybe other problem domains and like then use the same model. Problem which problem is similar to generate comments from code? Well, think about it. Maybe translation. What if I want to translate German into Hebrew? That's kind of the same. We want to translate code into English. I know how to say something in German. I, I will do it live, translating Hebrew to German. Okay, so try. The Hebrew one is yesh li tzipo. Yesh li tzipo. And yeah. which means I have a bird. Yeah, so in German that would be ich habe einen Vogel. Yeah, you could say that. I don't, I, I wouldn't. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. So, <clears throat> so what you do is you look at very similar problems and then you you can start with models you already find, try to tweak them and stack these building blocks. We're not gonna go into too much detail here, but um, that's basically what you would do. Yeah, and so we just took an architecture called Encoded Decoder, implemented it in Python. You could find it in the repository. We open source everything, unlike uh, a sim. Um, <laughs> and then let me show you how we train this model. So. Uh, we could install Python on our computer, but that wouldn't be the way I would recommend to somebody... Oh, the training, yeah. <laughs> that wouldn't be the way I would uh, recommend to somebody who's just getting started with machine learning to do it, because, you know, setting up your computer is like half a day of work. Mm. Fortunately, yeah. there is something better. It's called Google Colab. It is awesome. When so if you know StackBits, it is almost like the StackBits for machine learning. I mean, it's not really a code editor, but it, you can think of it as stack bits for machine learning. Yeah, so here I have uh, my Colab worksheet, worksheet, and I'm going to run these commands. You can probably see that I'm cloning our repo. So it, it runs these commands now in some machine somewhere in the cloud and cloning our code and also copies a small data set. Uh, let's have a look at the data set. So this is what we are going to feed to the model. It's a super small data set with just five functions and their comments. The functions have been translated to uh, more complex for us, but simpler for computer representation called the abstract syntax tree. And then there you have the comments, and you see that we replaced some of the text with argument number one, arguments number zero, et cetera. That was the preparation. Obviously, those information are very important to predict meaningful and correct comments, but for, for the first step of this model, we just replace them just to remove all the noise and to reduce the complexity. Fine. So we downloaded the code, the model, and uh, we can run ls minus l to uh, see, oh, we need a 
exclamation. We can run ls-l to see the list of files on the remote machines. And we can see like uh, it has all those files from our repo. And we are going now to run the training script. That would take probably uh, a moment or two. So basically, right now, what are we doing? So we're, we just started the training process. And as we can see, there is something called Epoch 1 of 5. And this Epoch is just another name of iterations. We have a data set that contains five sets of abstract ASTs and the comment for that function. And one epoch is going through all the data, data points, data entries we mm -hmm. have in our data set. And the training is really just an iterative process going through all these examples over and over again until that function, this model, produces, well, somewhat good results on, on a variety of inputs. Right. Uh, so it's almost done. And while it's working, we have trained it in Python, right? But we do need to figure out some way to get it into JavaScript. Yeah, I mean, we, we can run Python in, from the browser in the browser or, or from within JavaScript. That right. makes no sense. So we have to come up with this missing link in between. And I think we've already mentioned something that we can use, right? Yes, yeah, so basically, there is a TensorFlow.js, which is TensorFlow for JavaScript. And we have one more thing we, can, we need to do so we can use our model inside TensorFlow.js, which is basically convert it into a JavaScript model, uh, which is a JSON file. So here I'm running this uh, script to convert the model and create a zip file with the model that has been exported. You can think about this as remember that this model exists and that the machine mm -hmm. somehow comes up with this implementation. This is what we basically do. We, we export and convert the implementation of this model, this function, to a format that we can easily consume from JavaScript. Yeah, and the implementation is just a bunch of numbers. We can download a zip file. Wow, that's fast. And I would have extracted it, but I already did. So um, do you know um, Wallaby.js? Yes, it's an awesome tool that really allows TDD. Yeah, at but its best. we are not going to use it for DDD. We're just going to use it to test the model we just downloaded. So um, we created a small NPM package uh, called the uh, uh, TS comment predictor that has a new comment, uh, export a comment predictor class that knows how to load this model using TensorFlow.js. So you can explain what I'm doing while I'm doing it. So first of all, we need to load uh, to create a predictor. He's already explaining it. <laughs> uh, comment predictor, and it could load. I don't have a job. <laughs> so yeah. Sorry. <laughs> we put it, we wrapped everything, all the TensorFlow.js stuff in, in, a, in an abstraction. It's, it's a thing called comment predictor. We're loading the model that we just saved and converted into JSON that we can easily load it. Um, uh, and that uses generators, JavaScript generators, and now, what we do is create a function, one example that we want to feed in, that is the input to the model. And it's just a string, right? And then in the next step, awesome function. Technology plus is awesome. Good. Let's console log the result of running the predictor.predict .predict with the function code. And we're feeding in. What do you think is going to happen? Well, hopefully it produces some comment. It's thinking, you see. Let's see. Remember, this is, this is a very, very, very small data set. It was only five examples. And well, do you think that the results are going to be good or bad? Or no results at or all? Or no results at all, because machines never work. Yeah, it seems like uh, my computer is tired. Um, let's give it one more try. Maybe it should be, it doesn't like this kind of text. Um, so yeah, our model is lazy. We created a lazy model. <sighs> what have you done? Just like us, I would say. Well. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so to be honest, <laughs> this model was not very impressive. It wouldn't do no. a lot of stuff because we only trade it on five functions, and apparently it's all lazy. Um, so it will probably predict some nonsense, but. Maybe that's a sign. Maybe it says there is no comment because there is oh, no there's no comment. Yeah, there is no. Oh, oh there it now is. it worked. Woo. And as you can see, it's not very intelligent. What it says is technology, 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 technology. T T. Very important. Very T -T. important. That's typically how I end my comments as well. 
This is still a little bit impressive because the model did learn that there is slash and star in the beginning of comments and space between words, I guess. It has it's learned something, something. From five examples, not too bad. All uh, right. Let's take a look at a, at a real thing. Yeah, so we trained a model for an hour on a dedicated, Google has this dedicated machine learning hardware called TPU. So if we train this model regularly on our machine, I did it overnight, it took seven hours just for one iteration. And we had to do hundreds of iterations in order to, to get it good. But with a TPU, it takes like five seconds. My machine dies. I can't do anything else if I start the train. So yeah, definitely do it in the cloud. Yes. And once we had this model, and we saw that it sort of works in JavaScript, we wanted to integrate it into a Visual Studio Code extension. So how would you create a Visual Studio Code extension? So I mean, I know Angular, and Angular has this thing called schematics, which is scaffolding, right? And mm -hmm. there's also this tool called Yeoman. Yeoman. Yeoman, which we can use. It's like a scaffolding tool. And we just say, yo code. Yo code to generate an extension. We want TypeScript. We'll call it uh, Lazy Octopus. OK. Just, as just to match the theme. Yeah, as cryptic as the Angular release names. Uh, there is no description, no repository, NPM. And basically, at this point, we have uh, VS Code extension create for you see it writes the code for us. It's awesome. Awesome. This is machine learning. And as soon as it finishes, we also want to install here uh, our model and which we've published to npm, which is great. I mean, this this everything, sh all this shows you that it is not that difficult after all to consume these models. I mean, you can publish them to NPM. You can use the tools you already know. So don't be afraid of machine learning. You don't have to do all the data science yourself. You can get help for that or have someone that really knows data science. But as you can see, you can easily get started and then be in your comfort zone. Yeah, you see, just downloaded TensorFlow, and it's installing it. And I think if you ever created a Python environment, you would know how much time it takes to get this yes. installed. And mm -hmm. here we get it like in three seconds from NPM. You don't have to do anything, just NPM install. And now we have this uh, lazy octopus. We can open the newly generated code project in Visual Studio Code. And if we look at the package JSON, this is something special in Visual Studio Code extensions, we can see it defines a command. A command is what happens when you open the command palette. So when you create a new extension, you can add something to the list of the commands. So we'll create a command called at comment to function. Thank you for dictating this to me. Um, and then we would like to implement it. Actually, let's look at uh, the implementation that comes by default. It should show an information message saying, hello world. Let's just do a quick check to see if that works. I'm going to, p to hit F5. And hopefully, this is going to build the extension and open. Oh, <laughs> errors. NPM watch. What is the error? Say? Oh, so many errors. OK, I would say we, sk say we skip lip check. So yes, there's so a flag in, in the TS config file that, uh, well, lets you skip lip checks. Earth gone. Read about it at home. It's magic. This is the real magic. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's we appreciate it. that. That's good. Um, all right. So now we can press F5, and yes. we have another Visual Studio Code inside our Inception. And then we can uh, press. Uh, Oh, we see a new uh, command added, and when we click it, it says, hello world. That is awesome. So the only thing we have to do now is just to uh, implement it. Right. We just installed all these packages that we've uh, published to NPM, which contain the trained model and the abstraction. So we can easily just you know, implement everything here inside the Visual Studio Code extension. Mm -hmm. So let's so, do that. Yeah, let's start. So uh, yeah, I create. Oh, I need some utility functions. Let me uh, create these util functions, uh, util.ts. So this is cheating. We just coded it beforehand. But basically, these are functions that use the TypeScript compiler to get the current function you are currently looking at in the editor. And we have code that call that functions, basically returns the uh, current uh, element, that's the current node, the current TypeScript element you are looking at, and uh, find parent function 
returns the function you are currently looking at. So let's uh, do a quick demo of that where we just uh, display the function we are looking at, get text, and reload this. And now when we run the command, we can see that as soon as we click add comment to function, uh, it activates the extension and it gives us the function we were looking at, the same function. And so now, this is exactly what we need for our model. Yeah, that's the input that the model will get. Perfect. And let's load the model, right? Yes, let's do it. So importing and creating the model from the NPN package. And then the last thing we would need to do is like, uh, we, we are going to show a progress bar because this is going to take a few seconds to predict a comment. It says predicting comment. And this will call the predictor dot predict function, the one that we used in the text, with the function text. And then it will insert that comment at the starting position of that function. So just before the function, the comment will be automatically insert. Are we ready to see this in action? Yes, I want to see this. Okay. And by the way, this is nothing that we can rehearse because it's machine learning after all, so we don't know what's going to happen. We are going to run this on this function at time series. Will it work? Dim, Predicting dim, comment. Dim, dim, dim. <laughs> what is that? Satisfaction of a constraint to a function. All of these invocations are errors unless <laughs> otherwise, otherwise noted. noted. <laughs> <laughs> What do you say? Shall we try another one? Creative, I would say. <laughs> OK, let's try another one. So I would say this, oh, speedy function. <laughs> A speedy JS function has the async modifiers and contains use speedy JS directive. It doesn't have async. Let's see what happens if I do add async and run that again. Would that return the same thing? Uh, well, I would guess. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Observe returns true when objects are shallow equal. <laughs> yes. That's what I would expect from observe, I guess. Magic time. Let's see if it works. I hope it's not going to break this time. <laughs> Ooh! <laughs> Very nice. OK. So I think we can summarize. Uh, what have you seen here? So before we talk about our learnings, I guess, um, there's, there's things we can still improve, and we definitely want to continue working on this because it's just fun and fascinating. So um, overfitting is a problem. Overfitting means that the machine really just memorizes the entire data set. That's why it's, why it's so bad at actually predicting proper comments for something that it hasn't seen. So that's something we should definitely uh, fix. Yeah, I mean, we only trade on 2,000 functions, so it has a small data set, it can memorize it, but once we go, once we go bigger, uh, well, it won't be able to memorize everything, so it will have to be smart and learn. Exactly, but then there's the problem of memory cons constraints, because if you have a very, very large data set, you have to come up with um, uh, well, ways how, how to reduce the memory uh, requirements and all these things. So. Um, that's another thing we have right, to do. Right, but that's do. not your problem, because no. I think the important thing here, uh, you can use the help of a data scientist for the data science part. You just need to do the, you can just do the JavaScript integration, like integrate what they worked so hard to create into your applications. Yeah, and um, basically what, what we've seen is that how, how easy it is to, to get started with machine learning, even in, in the JavaScript world, right? We can easily use TensorFlow.js to convert Python models, then integrate them into, the, into a Visual Studio Code extension and all these things. Yeah, and uh, basically we, s we know that text summarization, which is what we try to summarize the code into a comment, is possible, like it's an active area of research and people are doing it. So we believe that with some more work we will get perhaps less funny, but more useful results. And we think that tight integration with existing tooling like Visual Studio Code is crucial to success. And this is where you come in, where you can take machine learning and integrate it into your environment, your application. And so I guess the main takeaway is that machine learning is exciting. And it's coming to JavaScript. And it's coming to JavaScript, and that you can all get started. Yeah, so you can see all the code that we created and the commits we did last night and this morning and after this morning and five minutes ago in the uh, repository. Uh, the slides are here. We'll also publish everything on our Twitters. 
And with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uri Shaker and Dominic Elm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, in a few moments, we'll have Elena Olson over here and uh, Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out.
Angular Connect 2018. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment, stack blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment. Stack Blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Oh, so we're waiting a, a few more moments uh, for track one to finish up and for everybody to come back. Just have a moment, technical issues, challenges. Okay, I think, yeah, okay. <laughs> Elena Olson is our next speaker, and she worked at Google, um, first helping uh, people migrate from AngularJS to Angular, and then helping people just develop with Angular, which is great, which is awesome. And uh, she's a student for software engineering at the San Jose uh, State University, and she's into software developing and dev 
Rel. Yes. And in her spare free time, she loves um, adventures and um, hiking, especially in California, in the mm -hmm. mountains and the different sceneries that you have in California, which is beautiful, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, Elena Olson, thank you. Thank you. So again, my name is Alana Olson. I hope you guys have been having a great day so far and enjoying all the different talks that you've been hearing today. Today I'm gonna to talk about how you as developers can find Angular more easily, how you can access your resources, how you can build applications faster. And so most people here today already know Angular. Some are experts, some are just beginning, but everyone is in a different place on their learning journey. We're all just boats sailing in the sea. We have different knowledge ranges. Knowledge is often specialized. Even people on the Angular team have stuff to learn about the Angular platform. And at some point, you'll be called upon to teach others, to teach your coworkers Angular. As you guys grow and expand, you'll get more people. And as you had to once learn Angular, you'll have to teach someone else. So it's important for us to understand how we can quickly get started. Today, I want to talk about who this talk is really most useful for. If you are learning Angular for the very first time, this talk is going to be great. If you're going to be teaching someone, which is basically everybody here today, about Angular, this talk will also help you. If you're searching for the best practices or you want to be able to find resources faster, this talk is really going to be useful. We're going to cover three main things. First, we're going to actually create an Angular application from nothing to deployment. Then we're going to be able to find resources more easily and expand your application with these libraries and other Angular resources. And finally, we'll go over how you can contribute to the Angular world, what you might want to do uh, with your team or how you want to help this effort. So I work as a developer relations uh, individual on the Angular team. That means that I'm talking with developers, understanding your experiences and your needs, and translating that into tools, documentation, and prototypes that will help you directly from your feedback. I study software engineering. I love traveling. I, that's why I'm here today, and also to share with you guys about uh, Angular. And in my spare time, I like to play lots of volleyball. So let's get into how we can create an Angular application from nothing to deployment. We see here, here's a flow diagram of exactly what needs to happen when you're creating an Angular application. You first are going to set up your development environment. Whether you choose to uh, prolong or put off the development environment setup and just start using Stackblitz, which allows you to immediately start building, or if you want to set up your CLI, which involves downloading Node.js, uh, installing Angular CLI, and choosing a package manager. Then we move into your building, which you're going to start using components. And you'll be able to start navigating through different views with your single page application. You'll then um, start managing data and taking in user data, compiling your project, and finally deploying it. You have an application. So the first step of this getting started guide is uh, setting up your development environment. And as I said, Stackblitz is a really great way of getting very quickly into programming Angular. You don't have to do all of this back end stuff. Um, and instead, you can just make your application and then build it locally at the end. But if you're like me, where you wanted to be able to build it from the start and have your, your setup uh, environment ready for any application, then I wanted to learn all the steps necessary. So to build locally, you first need to install Node. You can install what's called NVM, or Node Version Manager, if you want to have lots of different Node versions for different projects. That way, on this one project, I can use Node Version 8. And on another project, I can use Node Version 10. Um, and you can switch really easily. But this is an optional requirement. Then you're going to install a package manager. Whether you choose to use NPM or Yarn, uh, both of these will help you um, 
install all of your dependencies for your uh, project. You'll install the Angular CLI, and then you're going to create your application for the very first time with ng-new. And for our example application, we're going to call it a fish app because of the theme. You're going to open that directory, and then you're going to serve it. And you have this application. And it should look something like this. Everyone's very first application before they've added any code to their project will look like this. You can actually learn more information about how to build projects from uh, your opening page. But we want to add our own code. So let's get to the, to the building step. Now, when we're building an Angular application, we're going to start using components. And components are really useful because they help divide our entire screen into view sections so that we're creating one component that we can actually duplicate across views. We can create components really easily with ng-generate-component and then the component name. And when we do that command, it actually imports it into the Angular CLI and then adds that component name into the, your declarations uh, array in app modules, which I'll show very shortly. Let's take a look at what uh, our beginning application might look like. So we have some fish profiles, and each fish profile is a component. And when we create that fish profile component, every component is given a selector, a template URL, and a styles URL. Now, the selector allows us to take that component in brackets and put it in any HTML file and say, OK, we want this component here, and we want this component here, so we can duplicate it over and over again in different views. The template URL helps us define the HTML that's associated with that component. And the styles URL also helps us uh, associate the styles with that single component. So every component has a TypeScript file, an HTML file, a CSS file, and a spec.ts for your tests. Now, like I said, when we create that component, we're actually changing the app module. You import. It, when you do ng-generate, it automatically imports uh, that component name, which was fish profile component, and adds it to our declarations array so that your entire application is now aware of that new component. Let's break down the original screen into our different components. Here we actually have two different components. The, far, the first is the toolbar, and the second is the fish profile. Now, the fish profile is actually comprised of a ton of Angular Material components, which I'll go into very shortly. Angular Material is a great way for creating and adding components that are already pre-built and follow material design practices. Material components, they implement and they follow common patterns so that you don't have to build standard lists and tables and um, navigation bars, they're already ready for you. So one example of an Angular component is called MatCard. MatCard, an Angular material component, sorry, is called is MatCard. And MatCard has a MatCard header, it has MatCard content, and this way I can put a MatCard inside my component and have predefined components already in my application. Now, this Mac card is comprised of your Mac card header and your Mac card content. And all I had to do was include Mac card and those specific headers and content, and it did it all for me. Angular Material is really great for speeding up that process of just creating components really quickly and standardizing them with material design. Did you notice the directive that I slipped in that code? Here it is. Directives allow us to do uh, interesting things to our code. In this example, we have an array called fishies, and for every fish, we iterate over it, and we produce a mat card. And so I had a puffer fish, and I had an angel fish, and lots of other fish, and every single one of those fish had their own profile duplicated in a list. So we've created components for our application, and now we want to be able to have lots of pages. We want to make a single page application. The way that looks is here I've created a menu, and we actually have different pages that we will navigate to that will have unique URLs. So the first thing you need to do is to go into your app modules and import router module. 
then you define paths to get to different applications, uh, different pages in your application. So our home page, which is the empty brackets, is our fish profile components. And then we have another page called fish cam, which actually links to a uh, different um, uh, Angular component that displays a live fish recording. And then we are going to add router links into our menu that we've defined so that we can link to our home, we can link to fish cam anywhere in our application. So let's rewind a little quickly back. We can see here now we have our home page and we have our live fish cam page. These are our two router paths so far. So our next step is to be able to actually manage all the data. We're not just gonna be storing things in arrays, we're probably gonna have a database or an API that we wanna import data from. And that's where services come in handy. Services will contact your HTTP client and they will interact with an external API or database. And they will do queries for you, and then all the data that's coming through will go through your service and then injecting into your components. So that any data shared across components is provided by your service. Services are great because they help you fetch data, specifically data that is used across all components. And that data is protected because, and it's simply put into one area, which makes it very easy to know where your data should be stored and where it's coming from. In every component, you'll just inject the service and then you have access to that shared data. You'll use the simple command of ng generate service and then the service name that you want to use. And that will do lots of things like import injectable um, and create a service. And that way, in this simple example, we're just using an array of data, but we would normally be connecting to Firebase or something like that and adding data or getting data. And then, when we go to a component, we import that service and we inject it into the component so that we can get or add data via that component. And it's not data that's specific to the component, but it's data specific to your entire application. Now let's talk about forms. You have all of this amazing uh, single page application and you wanna be able to now take in user input. Forms help you capture and validate user input. The way that they do that is you can add um, specific validators to every single input to make it required or to have certain um, in, uh, form requirements. So if you're adding an email, you wanna make sure that it's an okay email to import and you can track these input changes. So let's take a look at what a form would look like. If I wanna have more fish profiles, I wanna ask people to submit these new fish profiles. So we're gonna take in a name, we're gonna take in a description, and we'll take in an image URL to be able to display those fish profiles. We're gonna be using reactive forms in this example. And so what we wanna do is import form group, form control, and validators. And that way, we can have a form group that is a group of lots of form controls. And each of those form controls is the name, the description, and the image URL. Then in your code, you define an Angular form and attach that form group name. And then you'll also have in each input with a material form field, you'll have um, the form control name. And that way, any input that you're given in that form, you can then add uh, to a submission in your database. You're collecting new data. Finally, you need to import th certain things into your app module, like reactive modules. Uh, we also use material form fields. And when you use material form fields, you need to also import mat input module. So we're now at our last step. We can deploy. And there's lots of different ways that you can deploy your application. A common way to use is Firebase. And there are lots of steps provided on the angular.io getting started page to help you understand how you can deploy on Firebase. When you have an Angular application and you're using Firebase, you're going to want to go through Angular Fire, which is a specific uh, way of using Firebase in conjunction with Angular. So let's do a demonstration of this application now that we've built it. 
It's a very simple application, but you can see here we have all of these different profiles that we have created. We have these different router links. So we have a home, we have a new fish profile where we can add a submission, and then we have this live fish cam that links to, um, I think, the longest standing video on the World Wide Web ever, and it's just some aquarium in someone's house. <laughs> or their office maybe. You sometimes see people walk behind it, but this is completely accessible and um, we've just linked to it and that's a whole new page we have. Obviously your application isn't going to be as silly as this, but this is the base for all Angular applications, is that you're going to have components, which uh, in this case we have fish profiles, we have a submission component, we have uh, a fish cam component, um, and you will have uh, routers uh, so that you can route to different paths on your application. You'll have input, so you're going to want to use forms, and you will always want to use services when you're using data that's shared across components. So we're kind of pros now at Angular because we know how to build applications and do all these crazy things. We can use components. We can have single page applications. We're balancing with everything. And you can build a way better application than what I've shared today that's way more complex, but it's really based on this foundation. So when we have this application, and you're already pros now, you want to be able to find resources a lot more easily. And in order to do that, you have to trust those resources and go through a vetting process so that you can understand what's good for your application, what fits, um, where do you find these resources? And so we created an application called Angular Ecosystem that compiles all of the best practices today of um, libraries and Angular tooling, Angular resources, and allows you to compare them really quickly based on bundle size, based on Angular compatibility, and based on accessibility in terms of uh, good documentation, frequent maintenance, we want to be able to speed up your integration with different tooling so that you can rapidly expand your application. It's not just a fish app, but it's a fish app with a really cool library that's installed, and it's a fish app with, built with uh, the best practices in mind. Let's take a look at what this Angular ecosystem actually looks like. So if we go here and we want to search for something like, um, let's just say UI for now. Generally UI, we don't really know what we want. We come up with a huge list of uh, information on different UI. So here we have Angular material. And we're provided with links, a really short description in this case, but often they have longer descriptions. And we can see here with like Angular Playground, uh, it supports ng-add. And this is what we call Angular compatibility or Angular features. If it supports ng-add or ng-update, it means that it can integrate with your Angular application really easily. And they built that in mind for this. It provides you with lots of helpful links, and eventually it'll actually be measuring bundle size based on a bundle size measurement tool, where you can see what the very base uh, and like bare bones model of that um, integration would be into your application, and then add up those numbers and see how big it would expand your application. So let's say you've browsed through this list, but you're not really happy with your results. You can actually submit a new resource. If you think that you have an, a fantastic new resource, or you know of one, or you're building one, and you think it should be on this list so that everyone can start using it, this is where you can actually add a submission. There's some standards for how we want to approve uh, new applications, and they will be passed across the Angular team. Um, so the current applications that are on this recommendation have been pulled directly from the Angular documentation and from teams that uh, we've already vetted, essentially. But we're looking for certain things that um, are common across tons of applications, uh, as well as um, libraries and other useful tools and resources. So let's just say, I don't know, we want to make a fish app. And it's of type fish, and it has some crazy description, some related search terms like fish and application, uh, UI. We are going to add, for now it's just going to be localhost, um, 
a funny URL, uh, let's say it's the same as the Git repository, doesn't have an NPM package, and for now, let's just say it supports ng-add. So we submit that application, and we're given a status to go to, um, and so when that uh, status is changed, it means that your application has either been approved or denied. And so as an admin, I can sign, I'm actually already signed in, and now I see this fish app. It's been submitted, as well as some other applications, and I can go in and review it and say, mm, this description's not so great, maybe we should expand upon it, or I know that this application actually doesn't support ng-update, or it does. Um, and so then I will go in and, for now we're just going to uh, not approve or deny anything. Um, but then we can go and um, see all the applications and everything that's already in this database and browse through it. So if you don't really know what you're looking for, and you just kind of want to expand your application, you can go through and look at everything, read their descriptions, and kind of understand what we're looking for in, the, in this database of information. Okay. And that way you can search very easily and compare all the tools very quickly. Done the demo. So in conjunction with uh, everything that I've already shared now, let's talk about the component structure of how this application, which Angular ecosystem was actually built with. So we have our app component, and we have about nine other components, and they're all related to the service in some way. So when we type a search entry, we're typing in the search bar, and that goes to your service and says, hey, I want to query the database for this search entry, matching with the search terms or the title or the category. And then that service returns values into our results list component. And the results list component provides all the information in that table that we were comparing. And at the very bottom, you can add a new submission, which will bring you to your submission status. All of these are unique components. And I could copy this new submission anywhere in the application and have lots of duplicates if I wanted people to submit a new application on every single page. And then we look all the way over into the admin console and we actually see that the admin console contains another component. And that way I could have specific URLs designated to each submission so that the admin console is kind of a shell and each submission that we have um, gets inputted into that admin console and fills it out and so you'd have admin console slash the submission ID, and it would change each submission you have. Let's take a look at this admin console. So you can see it visually now. We have the admin console, and then inside it is that submission. And we break down a little further, and we see that the admin console is actually comprised of a ton of material components. Crazy idea, those components are already built for me, so why shouldn't I just use them? They're really easy to import. You just import them and then you put them anywhere in any of your components and you're good. So we have the side navigation to scroll through all of our um, resources. We have our material card. We have another Angular form. And we have some like material radio buttons. All of these are pre-built components that I really like to use because they're super easy to use. So I talked a lot about submitting a new resource, and I want the community to be able to expand this application. So what are the criteria for approval? Good documentation is always a great start. We have to be able to understand our application before we can do anything with it. Frequent maintenance, maintenance is also important, and if you can provide simple integration with other tools, that would be really great. On the technical side, if you have NPM packaging, it's really easy to install your tool, um, if you support these ng features, which is ng add, ng update, um, if you have a small bundle size, which you can actually go to the bundle measurement tool that will be released soon and measure your application and then self-report it, that can help us understand how big your application would be if people started integrating it. And if you have automated tests. So how can we be part of the ecosystem? Please submit resources. We won't know about your application unless you tell us. And we want to accept as many applications as possible because there's so many great tools that everyone is building. And it's really great when we can integrate them with the entire Angular ecosystem. Help us establish more criteria from, for comparing resources. 
So if I miss something here today, and you were like, dang, this is a really great way to compare stuff, and she's just really missing it, like send me a mes message on Twitter. I think my Twitter's like on every single slide. And um, you can help us define better criteria. And if you want to expand this application and be a contributor, that would be really beneficial uh, for the entire Angular team and for me. Um, so if you can submit a PR, that would also be great. Here are the links in order to access NG Ecosystem. It's live on this crazy weird URL. Um, and if you want to go to the GitHub link, it's my GitHub slash NG Ecosystem for adding new criteria, if you want to message with some issues, if you want to submit a PR, or you have some crazy idea that, about expanding it, send us a message there. Thank you very much. If you want access to these slides, it's found here. It has all these useful links that I've talked about today, as well as the step-by-step -step process of getting started with your application. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Yeah. Oh. Angular sticker. I somehow brought Angular stickers this time, so come find me. Thank you, Alana. Thank you. Um, we're going to have a shorter break than uh, uh, planned, so we're going to uh, be back with the sessions uh, in 20 minutes, 4.05, is that right? 4.05, and the speakers in this room, you're needed in track one right now. Thank you. See you. Welcome to Angular Connect 2018. Again, this is a very special event. Please take advantage of connecting with other developers, with speakers. It's a unique opportunity that you won't have when you just interact with people online. It again is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. Experiment, stack blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. Ask those questions so you can get more information out. Again, this is a very...
Hi, and welcome back. So, next up, we have Dave talking about mocking made easy. Let's hear it for Dave. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's very, very cool to be here. I've been to a couple of Angular Connects, but this is the first time I've actually presented, so that's pretty cool. Uh, this is my talk called Mocking Made Easy, uh, but that doesn't really mean too much. Um, the probably more literal title we can take here is uh, <laughs> making your applications easy to test and run locally so you don't have to spend loads of time messing around with really annoying data marking solutions and can just focus on actually writing your applications. Yeah. Rolls off the tongue really well. Um, and those are the sort of titles that I give to conferences and meetups so I can give this talk. Uh, I think the really cool title for this is definitely uh, Marking and Glocking. Uh, it's really hard to find a picture of an actual solid gold gun or house, uh, so just had to improvise there. Anyway, uh, I'm Dave, uh, and I am a software developer at Ovo Energy, uh, and I really like open source stuff really like testing, uh, really like mocking, which you're about to find out, and you'll probably be sick about uh, hearing about it after this. Uh, but anyway, uh, really, really quick disclaimer. I've got massive baby brain. I've got a five-week-old daughter who's just here. Um, if I could just quickly be really, really cringy, get a little photo uh, up on stage, and we can all be collective like, ah. Uh, uh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, cool. Uh, let's, let's actually uh, cover something uh, that you, you paid to come for. <laughs> cool. So I want to talk to you guys about testing and running web applications locally, specifically mocking and, and how we do it and what I think the problem is. Um, and I'll probably hammer home a few different points uh, over the course of this, but I really think this is a topic that's been stagnant for quite a while. Uh, so I've sort of tried to think about things a little bit differently, uh, and I want to sort of explore some of our current sort of mocking solutions, and what I think a slightly different way of doing this is, uh, and you can form your opinions, and uh, let me know how much you love or hate it afterwards. But anyway, uh, running a web application locally on your laptop, whether we're developing features or improvements, or trying to recreate bugs, or uh, in my case, cause bugs, uh, that should be a really painless process. And being able to test all the different paths that your application can take, whether they're happy or unhappy uh, experiences, that should also not be a pain. Uh, if you need to do any sort of mocking, or if you feel like mocking is appropriate, that should also not be a pain. And whilst all of this is happening, your application state, it needs to be able to bend to what you want it to do and sort of be able to maintain the integrity of the data that you're working with. Um, and what we're referring to with happy and unhappy paths here, I'm sort of referring to things like, you know, your user is signing up to your application, they can do that successfully, or if they need to make a payment, they can do that, uh, et cetera. And you, you can see there as well, um, some things that aren't quite happy paths, uh, customers in debt, payment failed, unable to retrieve records, maybe your server's throwing back a 500, um, or whatever. Uh, and I'll probably interchangeably refer to happy and unhappy paths like that, or refer to them as scenarios as well. So um, just to give you the heads up on that. Uh, this should be pretty easy. Uh, I'm sure internally you're all groaning, uh, because it's not. Uh, a lot of places I've worked and a lot of projects I've looked at, uh, it's not really that easy uh, if I sort of come up to someone and ask them to bring up a customer in a particular state. You know, maybe they're in debt, um, or maybe there's something a bit weird or funky about them. Usually people have to tweak around with the database, or they're pulling stuff from somewhere they probably shouldn't. And it kind of sucks that that's just not a, a snappy sort of thing to be able to bring up uh, you know, entities in those particular states. Um, so I guess we can quickly explore how we typically see this being done. Uh, so you could run your application against a production service. If you do that, you will get sent to developer jail. Uh, that's a pretty... That's a pretty uh, sort of cardinal sin, I guess. Um, some people do it. I mean, I've done it in projects before. It's a bit naughty, but in developer jail, you've sort of got to argue about tabs versus spaces and <laughs> Vim versus Emacs and what the best language is. It's obviously TypeScript. Um, we could run our application against a staging or UAT service. Cool, so we're not touching customer actual live data now, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, unfortunately, you'll also go to developer jail if you do this. 
um, because typically you're accessing data that's on shared instances, uh, or maybe you know if you're accessing something that's coming from a database, the schemas are out of whack, or you don't have the right data in there that you want. Um, so that's still not really uh, great in my opinion. Uh, we could start to go down the containerization route uh, and run everything against a local copy of us, like our, our production services um, or staging services. And that's also sort of starting to head in the right direction. But unfortunately, um, it's still a little bit of a pain and you might go to dev jail. Um, you know, getting these things set up is typically an afterthought when you're setting up a project. You're not really thinking about dockerizing literally everything and, and getting that all nice and polished so you can work offline or, or, or work, you know, wherever. Um, so I'd probably, you know, I, I still sort of like shy away from that when I can. Um, but, you know, we've all heard of these things being done before. I've already admitted that I'm guilty of doing these sorts of things. I'm sure 95% of you are also guilty of it. Um, they are sort of our go-tos. Um, some of you are also probably thinking, why don't we run a mock server? Great, okay, we're starting to get into some cool territory. Um, we can definitely do this. Uh, you know, there's, there's so many options out there. Um, you've got things like JSON server, node mock server, API marker. Uh, that number I've got down there is probably pretty close to how many alternatives there are actually on NPM if you have a look. Um, alternatively, you know, if you're not familiar with any of those or you know, you might not have too many endpoints in your application, you might just roll your own local API. Maybe you just write a, a small node service to serve up some data. You know, if you've only got like less than 10 endpoints, that's also feasible. Um, none of those are bad solutions. Uh, and that gets you there for most of your use cases. Uh, you know, especially if you're starting something from scratch and you're sort of building up, rather than getting too tricky, you know, you can do that. Uh, a really quick example here is what a config looks like for JSON server. So for those of you unfamiliar, JSON server basically allows you to define a JSON file. Uh, it's keyed by the endpoints that you want your application to serve up. Uh, and then the values uh, there are just the responses for when you, when you hit those endpoints. So here we've got post, comments, and profile, and you can see the respective responses. Um, that's pretty cool, uh, and it's incredibly popular, so I'm definitely not discounting that. Um, I went to start writing an example for API marker, and I got a little bit annoyed because there was so much config. Uh, so you can take a look at that yourself. Um, the problem that I find with things that start to get a little bit more complex, like API Mocha, is that uh, it's pages and pages of JSON configuration, and then you start to introduce things like JSON path to you know, define different scenarios. Uh, and for those of you unfamiliar with JSON path, it's like X path, except 600 times worse. Um, yeah, it's not great. Um, but anyway, what else can we do? Cool, all right, so now we get to the fun part. Um, we have a little library that I wrote called Datamarks. Uh, and my fiance uh, came up with this logo one day and she said, Dave, I, gave, I created this logo for you and it combines two of your favorite things, uh, beards, obviously, uh, and ransom letters, which I thought was a little bit odd. Uh, and someone asked whether it was giving or receiving and then I got even more confused. Um, but yeah, anyway, um, we've got Datamarks. Uh, it uh, uses a code-driven config. Um, so that's nice, you're not writing loads and loads of JSON. Uh, it doesn't interfere with your existing code base, which is really cool. Um, and it's similar to Angular Multimox, which actually, Ed, who's in the, the audience here, he wrote that. Um, but it's a framework agnostic version of it, um, which works with everything, like vanilla JavaScript, Angular. Didn't know if I could use the R word, so I've sort of redacted a couple of things. So we've got blank and <laughs> blank native. Uh, you <laughs> So you can probably work out what those are. Um, it works with XHR and Fetch, so if you're, if you're working with something a bit more legacy uh, that uses XHR under the hood, or uh, even something really popular, like even still today, like Axios, that still uses XHR under the hood, um, or something a bit more new that uses the Fetch API, it works with both of those. It's super quick and easy to set up, what we're, which is what we're about to find out. Uh, and it supports scenarios, which is my favorite thing about it. Uh, and it's the thing that I think really sets it apart. Um, so, let's, uh, let's jump into some coding, which hopefully this doesn't go too badly. Let's jump out here, I can still see everything fine. So what I have is a very small uh, Angular application, uh, and it's a little widget factory, uh, which is super contrived, I know. Um, but all this is doing is it's fetching a, a bunch of widgets 
uh, from a node service and then displaying them. So here I have 10 widgets. Uh, and for, I guess, context here, uh, a widget is just an object that contains an ID. Uh, so we've got some sequential IDs here. Uh, and we've got a little button up the top which allows us to add a new widget. Um, and my application doesn't work quite as you'd probably expect. It doesn't retrieve something uh, in sequential order there. It retrieves a widget with an ID anywhere between 1 and 100. Um, and basically, uh, you know, this application was built to handle certain types of widgets. Uh, and I guess we could pretend that these things are a little bit more complex. You know, maybe they they have different categories. Maybe they behave differently depending on what sort of widget is being rendered on the screen. But maybe there's also other things. Maybe there are unsupported widgets, um, or maybe there's invalid data coming back from our server, or any of these sorts of things that we can't necessarily predict. And when we're developing this application, we want to be able to, you know, make sure that we've actually coded this correctly. Um, and sometimes that can be a little bit difficult. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump into our application here. Hopefully we can see this OK. Is that big enough? Yeah? No? OK. I'll just shout out if, if you need it to be bigger. Um, so basically, you've probably all seen this screen before in your Angular applications. Um, I've just imported a little random number generator that I wrote just so I don't embarrass myself trying to generate random numbers in front of you all. Um, and what we're going to do here is first we're going to mimic what my node service currently does uh, so that we can get the same behavior. And then we're going to introduce scenarios and, and just see how easy it is to be able to toggle between these. Um, so I'm going to kill off my little node service that I've got here. So that can go away. Uh, so now I don't have a working application. Um, so what I can do here is, first of all, I need a way of, in, I guess, an entry point to be able to inject my mocks into my application. Um, so as we've all probably seen before, we have a little if block here that says, if it's environment.production, then do something for prod mode. Um, similarly, we're just going to say, if we're not in production, uh, environment.production, and we're going to do some stuff here. Uh, so we need to import a couple of things. First of all, we'll import a function called inject mocks. Cool. All right. So we can add that code here. And we need to give inject mocks some mock data to actually and tell it how these mocks should behave. Um, fortunately, that's pretty easy. So let's, uh, let's define a variable uh, of scenarios. Now, this is all fully TypeScript supported. So we've actually got typings for our scenarios. So we can do that. And we can type that as scenarios. Uh, and all I guess this set of scenarios is is a mapping of a scenario to what we want our mock data to look like. Uh, and the minimum requirement for a set of scenarios is that we have a default scenario. Um, so here, um, I'll just quickly jump over to our entire application here. Um, we can see that we, we're calling two endpoints. We're calling the widgets endpoint to get a list of all of our widgets. And we're calling a new widget when we want to get a new widget. So first of all, let's have a look at what a mock looks like. Um, so there are only five things that you need to describe a mock with data mocks. Uh, one of them is URL, so it's just a regular expression matching on the endpoint that we want to, to mock out. So we've got widgets. The next thing is the HTTP method that we want to mock for that endpoint. Uh, and lastly, for the set of required things, is the response that we want. Um, so I think we probably want an array of uh, 10 items. Uh, let's see if I can remember how to do this. And we want their IDs for them. We want to return an object from them. And we probably want to do that. And I think that that will probably do that for us. Uh, and the two optional things that we can also uh, define for each of our mocks uh, is a delay in milliseconds. So we can sort of make it simulate as if this request is really hitting our HTTP server, which is nice if your application's got things like loading spinners or, you know, or, or loading animations and stuff. So you can sort of see that in action. It gives you a good look and feel uh, while you're doing this. Uh, and then lastly, we've got a response code, which is just the HTTP response code. Um, and that's it. So we can do that for all of our endpoints that we have here. And we should, uh, we should be in, in business. So we'll also do it for a uh, new widget. And the method is get. Um, the response here is a little bit different to the one above. Um, I've got that rand function that I imported before. So we'll just make it return one widget with a random ID. 
uh, and we'll keep, we'll make the delay for this 2,000 milliseconds, um, and we'll keep the response code, whoops, response code at 200, and there we go. All we need to do now is pass through our um, uh, scenarios through to inject mocks, and that should work just nicely. Let's get rid of that semicolon. Um, the other thing that we can also explicitly pass through to inject mocks uh, is the name of the scenario that we want to run as well. So we'll explicitly tell it to run the default scenario for now, even though uh, it'll implicitly run that if you've only got one scenario anyway. Um, but hopefully, if I've done that OK, I should be able to come here, and I'll reload the page again, and you can see I've got that exact same set of functionality, which is really cool, and I can click Add New Widget, and it waits a couple of seconds, and now it gives me an, a, a random widget. Yay, we've got that. <laughs> cool. Um, but that isn't particularly useful for anything other than uh, a happy path. Uh, so I want to just sort of uh, disclose a little bit more about my application. Uh, super contrived, but that's OK. Um, in the template for this, actually, uh, we're considering any widget whose ID is greater than 100 to be a dangerous widget. Um, and we haven't actually seen this behavior yet, but we've already written the code for it, and we probably want to see it in action. Uh, we might want to write tests around this later as well. So we need a way of being able to simulate that. Um, so what we can do is we can keep our default scenario, because that's like our, our happiest use case of our application. Uh, and let's define a new scenario here. Uh, we can call it whatever we want, uh, but we'll call it bad widget. Uh, and what we're going to do here is we don't need to rewrite all of the mocks for everything, because we're only really concerned with when we get a new widget, what happens when it's a bad widget. Um, so all we'll do is we'll write a new mock for new widget, and it will be forget again. And instead of responding with something that has a random ID, we'll respond with something with an ID of 101, and we'll see what happens. Uh, we'll keep the delay and response code the same. Cool. So what we've got here now is we, just as I said before, we need to tell the inject mocks what scenario we want to run. And I can show you something that makes this a little bit cooler in a second, but for now, we'll just run bad widget. And we'll come over here, and this is gonna get pretty ugly, because a bad developer wrote this code, and oh no, we have a really dangerous widget now, and it doesn't look good, and something's gone wrong, and we need to fix this bug. Um, and I guess, like, obviously, you could imagine this a more real-world case, you know, what happens when the data isn't what you think it's going to be, or that there is a bug. Um, but yeah, I think you can sort of see what I'm getting at here. But um, one thing that is a pain is I don't want to have to go back into my code every single time I want to change scenario and tell data mocks to run this scenario. So fortunately, I've written a little helper function, which is called extract scenario from location. And what we can actually do is pass through the window.location object through to it. And now we can save that and come back into our code. And you'll notice that uh, when I click Add New Widget here, this will just run as normal through our default scenario. But what we can do in our browser is through the query string, if we specify a specific scenario that we want to run, uh, in this case, we've got bad widget. I'll just zoom in a little bit there. Um, when we run this, Instead of getting our default scenario, when we click Add New Widget, we now get back to getting our, our dangerous widget. And that's quite handy, because now I don't actually need to go back to my, browse, um, back to my code uh, and, and work out what scenario I want to run. Uh, I can just run it straight from my browser, and that's nice and quick and easy. Um, but I'm just finishing off work. Unfortunately, I don't have it here to demo, but uh, a Chrome extension which uh, works out what scenarios are available and just allows you to toggle between them uh, within a nice, pretty uh, Chrome extension, so that's quite cool. Um, so sort of keep your ears peeled for that. Um, but we'll just jump back in here. Um, and I guess I've sort of shown you something that is quite handy for, you know, we're developing features, we're fixing things, we're improving things, and maybe the endpoints for these don't exist yet. So you don't, even if you wanted to, you can't even hit an, a, a running endpoint for this. And we can mock out those responses. But I think that stuff like this can really do a bit more uh, than, than that for us. Uh, when we're running things like UI tests, 
uh, to test like the integration of certain things that don't require you know network activity or um, or sort of like I guess third party services that absolutely must be cold. Um, this is a really nice solution for that as well um, because you can run different scenarios in your integration test and you don't need to hook up anything else into it. Uh, obviously, tools like Cypress also have uh, fixtures that you can run and you can have mocked routes for that, uh, which is really cool. Um, and I guess if you're leveraging that, there's no need to leverage this, but sometimes it is nice to just leverage one set of mocks. Like, for instance, um, if I go back to my code real quickly, you know, we've got all of our mocks in this, um, this main.ts file, but we could abstract this out into a, mo a separate mocks file so we're not sort of polluting our bootstrap code here. Uh, and then you could share that set of mocks between this and your UI tests as well. Um, but that's ent obviously entirely up to the developer what they'd like to do for it. Um, so I guess I've been talking a little bit about the things I think that are really great about this. I guess there still are some things that this is lacking. Um, because we're intercepting the HTTP requests before they go out of your browser, nothing um, appears in your network tab, uh, which is a little bit of a pain if you want to debug the order in which requests were uh, executed in, uh, and a load of other stuff like that. So I think that I probably still need to uh, add some logging middleware into that, um, or accept a pull request if anyone's interested in that. It's probably quite quite a good one. Um, things like uh, simulating paginated data. I know a lot of the other sort of competing things also uh, do that. Um, and it doesn't have GraphQL support yet. Um, I've sort of been thinking a little bit about that, but I think it's going to require quite a lot of thought there. Um, I also need more people to test it. I'd love for, you, for just even if one person were able to go out and have a look at this, um, I do think it's a really great way of handling this sort of uh, this sort of way of being able to develop code. Uh, it's really quick and it's really easy. Uh, and it, it stops you needing to rely on uh, either someone or yourself writing a working endpoint uh, or even just the pain of having to write pages and pages of JSON just to, just to get your mocks up and running. Um, I guess just concluding, uh, I don't really think that this is a silver bullet solution. Um, there are trade-offs. You can't uh, at the moment, you can't ensure that the mocks that you're providing are of the right type that your endpoint is also providing. Um, I am also working on something that will take in something like a Swagger or a RAML specification to ingest that and ensure that the mocks that you're writing fit those specifications, um, which is pretty cool. Um, but as I said at the very beginning of this, I really do think that this is a stagnant topic. Uh, almost everyone I speak to, when I ask them what they do for working locally, they either pull data from staging or, or um, prod, uh, or they'll use some, some JSON-based uh, mocking solution. And I still don't think that we're quite there yet. We haven't really progressed in the ways that certain other facets of web development have been progressing this decade. Um, so I guess I just think that it would be really cool just to, to get more involvement in this, uh, this problem space at the moment. Um, there are some useful links at the end of this talk. There's a few underlying libraries that I really leverage, uh, and I wouldn't be able to make this possible if it weren't for that. Um, I'll put out the, the slides for this on my Twitter and all of that. Um, but yeah, this, that's basically it, guys. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, please clap and cheer very loudly. You can carry on clapping, because I think that is definitely one of our first. I don't think you've had a baby up on stage before. So give him another clap. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> so up next, um, here we've got offline, uh, offline first in Angular. And next door in track one, we've got profiling Angular apps like a shark. We're going to try and do this changeover quite quickly. So uh, see you back soon.
a couple of those. Well, we have, have right they now. have their own. Yeah.
Hi, welcome back. How are you all doing? Everyone still awake? Yes? Okay. So next up, we've got Martha, who's going to be talking to us about offline first in Angular. So let's hear it for Martha. Hello, Angular Connect. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see my slides? Yes. Everyone? Yes. Great. So it means that we can start. So hello, everyone. My name is Marta. I'm from Poland. And today I will be talking about a totally great topic. This is offline first in Angular. And before I start my session, I have a question to you. So how many of you have ever heard about PWA? Good answer, so you don't need introduction. I can skip some of the slides, so it's very great. And my second question is, whoever built PWA? Good answer, in Angular, maybe? Good answer, yes. So if you're using Angular, it's very easy to create your basic PWA with basic PWA features, because you can apply it simple one command, this is ng add Angular PWA, and a lot of files that are required to build your PWA will generate it automatically. And it's very simple, especially where, the, where you have a static data in your app. And the character of your data is the main factor that tells you that it's worthy convert your web app into progressive web apps. And today I want to focus about managing data in your app and show you one approach, this is offline first, that allows you to um, store your data locally and synchronize it with the backend automatically. And it's also a good way to improve performance of your app and user experience. And a few words about me. So um, I'm from Poland, I live in Warsaw, and I work for a company called ePoint. This is a software house where it's, and it's almost focused on financial and e-commerce sector. And e-commerce, there's a lot of use cases of PWA. And now I'm working on the project that is in Angular, and we use Spartacus. A Spartacus is also written in Angular. This is a storefront for e-commerce. And this is, it allows you to create components and mm, new things that are necessary for e-commerce and are fully progressive and open source. So you can find mm, a code on GitHub. And I'm a huge of PWA. And my journey with PWA started over one year ago when I was writing my master's thesis. And in my thesis, I compared progressive web apps and hybrid apps. And then I also started to create an open source project, this PWA Fire. In this project with Maya Edwin, we create open source resources, code labs, and tools that allows you to create PWA easier and with best practices for web apps. And I'm a huge fan of community. I'm a member and organizer at Google Developers Group Warsaw and Women Tech Makers Warsaw. And if you have never heard about these groups, or you want to join these groups in your city or host the events, ping me after the presentation. I would love to help you. And this is the plan for us for today. So at the beginning, I will introduce you into the offline first approach. I will tell you what is in general the strategy. I will show you advantages of this approach. And next, we will go to the offline storages because this is a key point to understand um, this approach. After that, I will show you a PouchDB. This is one technology that enables you to store your data locally on a, in a browser, on a local site, and then synchronize it with the backend. Next point is AppShare model. So this is the way to increase performance of your app. And the next point, I will show you offline first apps that we're already creating with this approach and with PouchDB. And today, I want to introduce you to this offline first approach by but I also want to show you how a big impact developers have on human lives. And today, stress and negative energy has a big impact. And maybe sometimes you feel like this frog from the picture, that something happens too many times to you, regardless of you, and again and again. Do you know this? <laughs> and maybe sometimes you feel good, but then it's better, and you feel unstable, dangerous, you're totally unstable, like, I don't know, like this. Or even as simple, small things totally frustrate you. Typically, circle, loading, small things like this. So as you can see, the sadness, the negative emotions are really important today. And a bunch of scientists 
um, did a research on human brains, and he was trying to find solutions how to make people happier. And the results was totally surprising because they discovered that the only one way to make people happier is create fast and stable apps and use offline first. And what is in general offline first? So it means that being offline should not be an error condition. And I suppose that you already know that, but maybe not from web apps, but typically from native apps or desktop apps. If you're using Spotify and you're offline, you're not able to track music, but you're still able to edit playlists and do stuff like that. When you have internet access again, all your clients are synchronized and you see this data that was changed. If you're using Slack, the desktop version, and you're offline, you're still able to use these apps. You're not able to send message, but your app's still working and you inform about the offline state. So what we do in web apps is that we store our data locally on the front-end side, we cache it, and show that to the users. And at certain times, we synchronize with the backend and store new data and fetch new data. So from developer's perspective, you need to write your app up as it, it has no internet connection. So I really like compare it with mobile first. So for mobile first, you start implementation for smaller screens. And after that, you need to enhance it for bigger. And here, you start an implementation for offline state, and then you can add more capabilities to your app to make it more powerful. But you need to be sure that your apps work offline. Um, and there's a lot of advantages of this approach. And the first one is quite obvious, that you can actually build apps that are being able to work offline. But there's more. You're able, for example, to create faster user interfaces, because all your CRUD operations, create, treat, update, and delete, are moved locally on your device in a browser. And we store separated data of our app of its user interface. And we also can apply app shell model, which is really great because of performance of your app. The next point is about creating better user experience, because your user can use your app all the time, and you can inform about the state of your app, of the network, so it's very cool. And the last point, so you can batch up network requests, so you can sync up with the backend periodically versus all the time, so you can save boundaries and also improve battery life. And there are golden rules of offline's first approach. So the first one, we should use local data whenever it's possible. So you can use XML HTTP requests to get network re requests, and you can store it locally. And you have few possibilities to do, this, to do this. For example, you have cache API, index database, and other offline storages. The second point is about storing separated user interface from its data, and I suppose that you already do this in your app, even if you're not familiar with this offline-first approach, because it's just easier to manage your data and your logic in your Angular app. Next point is about, about storing state of your app um, locally and on remote, remote if it's possible, um, to allow the user to pick up whenever he left off. And the last point about testing, so you should make sure that your app works perfectly in common and tricky scenario. And sometimes testing progressive apps can be difficult, but it's really, remember, it's really important to remember about this. So now let's talk about offline storages. So I think this is a key point to understand this offline first approach. So this is list with basic storages, and I suppose that you already know that, because they're very common. So for example, session storage and local storage are external um, um, storages that allow you to store data in your browser. And session storage allows you to store data for the duration of page session, including restores and reloads of your page. But local storage allows you to store your data even if you close and you open your browser. And they're really common, but have the downsides. For example, you need to serialize and deserialize your data. Um, they are synchronous, so can block your app. And they don't have support for web workers. Um, if we're talking about WebSQL, so WebSQL is asynchronous, so it's based on callbacks, so it's a little bit better, but also doesn't have support for web workers. So there's, there are alternatives. So you can use, for example, File System API or File API. They support Web Worker. 
And File System API um, doesn't have much power outside of Chrome, and it's, out, it's sandbox, which means that you can't get native file access. File API is a little bit better because of um, browser support, um, and includes interfaces like File API, Blob API, or File List API. But particularly in our offline first apps and PWA, we use Index Database and Cache API. And Index Database, this is document database that allows you to store pairs of key and value. And you can store here different types of data. It can be strings, blobs, um, JSONs, and so on. And it's the greatest one because of support for web, um, for web browsers. And in Cache API, you can store pairs of requests and response that represent the HTTP request and HTTP response. And you can they can contain any kind of data that can be transferred over HTTP. And what we do in offline first is that all, all um, necessary files that are static that you need to that you need to cache. Mm, and reload to work while you're offline, you store in cache, but for all other resources, you need to use uh, index database. And there are JavaScript libraries that are wrappers for index database, because index database can be sometimes complex mm, for some cases. And they are just more developer friendly and allows you to use this index database easier. And today I want to focus on PouchDB, but there are more solutions, for example, DexyJS, or JS Store, or Local Forage. And this storage has limits. And as you can see, it depends on the browser. And these limits are set per origin. Um, and you can use Quota Manager that allows you to, to check how many quota is already reached. And I highly recommend you to open DevTools and the tabs with application, because here you can check what is stored in specific types of storages. And here's, for example, for Twitter. Twitter is also progressive web app, so I think we, it will be a key for you to understand um, what can you keep and store in this kind of storages. So now let's talk about PouchDB. So PouchDB is open source JavaScript library that allows you to store data locally sync it with the bucket automatically. And this is what I said before, that it's a wrapper for index database. And this is a basic architecture that, that you can use in your Angular app. You have front-end side and back-end side. And on front-end side, you have PouchDB, when you can store your data locally. And you have back-end side, when you can store data remotely. This is, Pouch, this is CouchDB. And CouchDB, this is document database that is really similar to the MongoDB, if you ever, if you ever used. And what we do in our um, front-end apps, we store data locally, and then we need to send it to the back-end site. So we hook it up with the back-end for replication. And if anything changes on the back-end site, then it push changes to the front-end site. And we can subscribe these changes and react in proper way in your app. So now it's time for more practical practical part. So let's suppose that you have app, Angular app generated with CLI, with basic Angular structure, and then we want to make it work in offline, and then manage your data that is offline. So the first step, we need to cache data that is static, and for me the easiest way to do this is just apply this command, this is ng at Angular PWA, because if you apply it, a lot of things will happen, and you will generate basic files that even if you, that are default and if, if, even if you build it and you start and deploy it on a remote server, then your app will, will work offline. And the next step is that we need to manage dynamic data in your app. So we need to add to your app, for example, PouchDB, that's a wrapper for index database. And there are a few steps to apply this PouchDB. So you need to install it as usual, as npm package. So you have two options. First is PouchDB, mm, the whole package. And the second option is smaller package only for the browsers. And if you don't want to install other dependencies, like, like for example, level database, 
I recommend you to use the second one. And the next step is installation of PouchDB server, because you need to serve your local data um, in your app. Then you need to serve it, and if you want to apply it in your app, you need to use um, this, this, the last one comment. So if you want to add it to your file, you need to um, create your local database. This is PouchDB. After that, we need to hook it up with the backend for replication, and you can use method sync. And you need to add this remote database and configure it. So you need to set the configuration for replication. And in this case, you can see the bidirectional synchronization. Next step is as usual. You need to implement your CRUD operations. So the basic operations to manage your data in your app, like get, push, delete, and stuff like that. And the last one, sorry for the forbidden word, you need to subscribe to these changes and react on proper way. It depends what you want to do on these changes. So now let's talk about option model. So the option is the way to render a portion of your app via a root as a static render page. And it allows you to increase user experience um, by rendering static pages that you can return to the user very quickly. And from practical perspective, this is that there are the minimal HTML, CSS, and JavaScript code that is required to power the user interface of your app. And on the right side, you can see an example. So this is how it looks. It's just a skeleton of your app common for all pages. And you can use schematics in Angular to generate this, this kind of app shell. So you need to input ng generate app shell and add two properties. The first one is client project, so the name of your project. And the second one is a name of your universal app or server app. So if you generate it, a lot of things will happen in your project, but the main change will be in your, in your Angular JSON file in configuration. So you will see two other targets regarding to this app shell. So next point is building. So we need to run ng run command, and regardless of your environment. The second one is for the production. And I did tests. In my tests, I created a um, simple Angular app. I built it and deployed it as usual. And after that, I added option model to this app and deployed it on another host. And I did a test. I refreshed these apps 10 times. And here you can see the visual effect that on the right side, when you have an app with option model, you can see that you refresh it. So um, you get the view very quickly. This is, this is how option model works. And here you can see um, performance results tests. So can you, can you see these five metrics? This is slow time, first byte, start to render, first content full byte is speed index, and the value for this test. So as you can see, for each of these metrics, um, the difference between the values was over 20%. So this is what can you achieve with AppShell model. And now I will present you an example of offline first apps that was creating with this approach and with PouchDB. So this is Hospital Run, and it's really cool. So this is open source software for developing world hospitals. And it's great because you can take it into areas where you don't have internet access at all, and you can store um, healthcare data. And when you back to the places when you have internet access again, then your data will be synchronized with all your clients. And this is open source, so you can find a code of, the, code of this app on GitHub. Cozy Cloud is really cool for your daily life as a developer, for example. You can store it contacts, calendars, and files, and share it between your clients and between server. And Financer is for storing budget data um, in your personal devices, and it's really cool for apps when you can store this data and then synchronize it with other clients um, and other devices. And I want to sum up some things. So today we're talking about offline first approach that you can use in PWA. So I highly recommend you to try PouchDB and other, and others wrappers 
that can help you to manage your data in your apps. And I want you that you will remember about that offline first is not only about creating apps that work offline, but also it's a way to create fast and stable apps, and it's a way to save the world from sadness. And I want to advise you to PWA and offline first communities. So sometimes maybe you have a problem and it's difficult to find a solution because it's not a huge community. So here you can see two spaces, this, there are Slack spaces, where you can ask questions and find people that also work with progressive web apps. If you want to keep in touch with PWA, you can follow PWA Fire. And if you have any questions about this, you can ping me on Twitter. And this is a great book if you want to use PWA with Angular. It was published this year, and, and I highly recommend you to use it. And thanks for having me. If you want to get the slides, there is a link. Thanks. Thank you very much. So um, next up, we have in here uh, the coming fad, future accessibilities for developers. And next door in track one, automating your Angular project with schematics. Uh, we'll again, we'll try and start um, quite quickly. Thanks very much.
Hello and welcome back. So we're nearly at the end of the day. So before we go, we have one more talk coming up from Gerhard, the coming fad, the future of accessibility for developers. So let's hear it for Gerhard. Well, hello, welcome everybody. Um, I hope everyone has had an awesome day. I always get a lot of inspiration from all the talks here at Angular Connect, and I hope I can add a bit more to the ocean of inspiration you've already gotten about accessibility, or more specifically, about the coming fad, the future of accessibility for developers. First off, a bit about me. My name is Gerard Boer. I'm the lead front-end developer at Ilionix, where I'm specialized in Angular, and I have an interest in accessibility. I come from Groningen, which is a small city in the north of the Netherlands, and in my downtime, I play a little bit of Rocket League. <laughs> Woo, <laughs> nice. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at the handle at GHBoer, where I tweet about Angular and accessibility. So for the coming 30 minutes or so, I would like to talk to you about the current state of accessibility. I would like to talk to you about uh, how you can actually define accessibility, who it's for, and then we're going to go a bit deep into the technology of accessibility, how it works under the hood. This will help create an understanding about the future of accessibility, currently in the form of a specification called the Accessibility Object Model. And I'd like to close off with some of the things you can do right now to improve accessibility in your applications. So first off, what is accessibility? How can we define this? Most people, when they think of accessibility, the, the first thing they think of is using a screen reader to interact with the web, right? You can actually take this a lot bigger. When you think about accessibility, you can think about them in terms of inputs and outputs. A fully accessible web application can actually be used by any form of input, so maybe just only a keyboard, only a mouse, maybe only using your voice, or using gestures in order to interact with the application. On the other side, we have the outputs, where we can have a screen reader like VoiceOver, or JAWS, or NVDA, but maybe also only a text-only browser that doesn't have any colors to convey information about the application. Or maybe the user uh, is visually impaired and needs to use a separate device called a braille reader in order to uh, read everything that's on the web. We can combine these technologies under, under the term assistive technology. So when we're talking about assistive technology, we mean any kind of input or output that is used to increase, maintain, or improve functional capabilities of the user. So the goal of accessibility is to get the web accessible for everyone. And when you think about who actually needs or could benefit from using assistive technology, you can uh, imagine uh, we're getting to the point that actually gets a quite big group of people that can use uh, assistive technology. So there's a term coined by Microsoft called inclusive design. You can uh, check it out on their website. It's a very big research uh, plan written out. And um, they thought more about all the people that actually could benefit from assistive technology. So they figured they could actually separate the groups into three different parts. First off, there are the permanent accessibility uh, assistive technology users. So these are the people who might have lost an arm and can't use certain key combinations or a combination of the keyboard and mouse to interact with your application. The people who are completely blind and need uh, a screen reader or uh, one of those braille devices to interact with the application. Or people who are deaf and they need subtitles to uh, know what's going on in a video. But next to the permanent group, you also might have a group that are only temporarily impaired and might could benefit from using assistive technology. So you might have just gotten an arm injury and got your arm in a cast, so you can't use the certain key combinations. Or got surgery on your eyes, so you could just benefit from using a screen reader for a short amount of time. Then there's also the situational group of people. So this is just for a very short amount of time. They could benefit from using assistive technology. So Microsoft has, done a, Microsoft has done a lot of research about this, um, and they checked out that in America, when you take all these three groups together, together over 20 million people could benefit from using assistive technology um, in the web applications. So there's actually quite a lot of people that could uh, uh, benefit from uh, the accessible applications that we write. So now we'll get into about accessibility and how does it work. Um, the most important part about the technology under the hood is the accessibility tree. The accessibility tree is built from the DOM tree. So for almost every node that is in the DOM, an equivalent node is created in the accessibility tree. I say almost every. For performance reasons, some DOM nodes that have no information uh, whatsoever gets omitted from the accessibility tree, so assistive technology can actually uh, perform a bit faster. 
So how do we get information from the DOM into the accessibility tree? Well, the most easy way is to write semantic HTML. So don't use diffs or spans for every single element in your application, but use the nav tag, field sets, uh, headers and footers, or sidebars. These actually add more information to the accessibility tree and thus give the assistive technology a lot more power to interact with the application. Then there's also a standard called ARIA, which stands for Accessible, uh, Accessible Rich Internet Applications, which means you can actually add a few attributes to certain elements and make them accessible if they have no information by themselves whatsoever. Okay, so you might be thinking, that's maybe a bit abstract, I'm not really sure what's going on, maybe staring a bit into space. So let me try it a bit more concrete for how this actually works. The browser might run into a tag, something like this. So this is an image tag which has a source attribute pointed to an image somewhere on the server and the alt attribute describing what's actually on the image. This gets painted through the DOM tree into the actual visual UI on the monitor. And concurrently, a node is created in the accessibility tree describing what this image is all about. So it might have uh, a node created image which has the name attribute uh, filled with actually the information you have in your alt attribute. So if you don't fill the alt attribute and just have your image linked in the uh, HTML, it means the name property in the accessibility does not get filled and the user of the technology has no idea what's going on in the page. Even worse, the node uh, might actually be omitted for performance reasons from the accessibility tree and the user has no idea what's going on. So always make sure you have these attributes in your images to have access technology users um, be aware of everything that's going on in your application. Then if we go a bit bigger, we have some, maybe some interaction in our application in, um, from the way of forms. So here is a diagram of accessibility tree of how a form could look like. So we have a form with a radio button, a slider, and a normal button. The name attributes for the radio button and the slider actually gets derived from the label element that it's linked to. So you need to use the for attributes in the label and have the ID for the, the value for that for attribute referencing the ID attribute of the form control. If you don't put this link, again, no information is added to the accessibility tree uh, about what this element is all about. And this technology user is unable to know um, what uh, radio button they're actually pressing. They just hear a radio button and have no idea what's going on. So in the case for a radio button, it could also have a state, whether it's selected or not. And it can have actions that the accessibility tree um, emits to the assistive technology, which then corresponds to a certain event on the DOM node. So the action press results in a specific event on DOM node, the, specifically the click event. For a slider, well, it could have a value, the current value, a minimum and a maximum value, which is conveyed to the accessibility user. And it could have actions, like increment or decrement, which can result in uh, increasing and decreasing the value in the slider. And um, which probably, uh, well, if you follow the specification really closely, you have to uh, implement the up key and down key in order to actually have this implemented in your um, application. Luckily, a slider is a native component, it's a semantic component, so we don't have to do it ourselves. Um, but we'll get into something more specific later on where this could, solve a pro uh, could be a problem. Finally, there's the button. Well, the name gets usually derived from the value that's within the tag, and the action press results in a click button, a click action on uh, the button itself. Then I said something about ARIA. So with ARIA, you can make any element that is not accessible by itself get added into the accessibility tree. Here we have an example where a div behaves as a checkbox, so you can style it in a certain way in your application, but it also gets added as a checkbox in the accessibility tree. I mean, don't do this, use the input type checkbox, that's what it's there for. But if you have absolutely no other way than to uh, build something like this, you can use ARIA to make any element an accessible element and be added to the accessibility tree. So when we look to the complete picture, we have something like this. Our HTML gets built into the DOM tree. The DOM tree then gets painted into, into the visual UI. And it gets transformed into the accessibility tree. This accessibility tree then gets read via a native operating system API to the assistive technology. And this API is different for each operating system. So w w Windows, Linux, and OS X all have their own implementation, which the accessibility object model also has some ideas about on how to solve this. Then nowadays, we write a lot of JavaScript in order to have our applications a lot more interactive. So this comes in from the side, modifies the DOM tree, which then needs to be reflected into the accessibility tree, and the technology needs to be updated. 
This is currently a lot of work for the browsers and could be done a lot better. Although, if you look uh, at this image, you might say, well, we've given the user all the crutches they need, right? They can get it right on the web, they can, we can use ARIA to make our application a bit more accessible, everything is fine. However, like I said, there are a few issues. First of all, ARIA is quite sensitive for developer errors. Like I said, you need to have that relationship, for instance, between a label and a form control um, exactly right. And if you make one typo in one of the two relationships, the name attribute is not filled, and the user of assistive technology has no information about that element. Furthermore, with the coming advent of web components, we can add a lot of custom elements to our web applications. However, these are not semantic by themselves whatsoever. The browser cannot infer any intention about the web components just by themselves, and we as developers need to add a lot of properties in order to add it to the accessibility tree. Then there are also a few limitations. For instance, ARIA needs elements to have information to be added into. But if you take some high-performance graphical UI that's built in the canvas, you only have one element to add your information into. So um, well, this limitation uh, actually uh, means the canvas, the UI that you've built, does not get added to the accessibility tree, and this technology user has no, info, has no way to interact with that application. And lastly, it's quite hard to automatically validate accessibility rules. We have a few static analysis rules, which means you can check whether those relationships are set right, but it doesn't get the full information about the accessibility tree because it's not available that way in the browser. Enter the accessibility object model, or in short, the AOM. Currently, it lives as a specification on GitHub. It's championed by people from Google, Apple, and Mozilla, which gives, it a which gives it a lot of traction to be added to the browsers Chrome, by extension Edge nowadays, Safari, and Firefox. It's currently still in development. It's, it's quite experimental. There have been a few rewrites. There have been a few pivots. It's gone from being one model, something like the DOM uh, akin to the AOM, to more like a set of changes that it would like to add to different parts of the ecosystem, to different parts of the specification. They plan to do this in four phases, and we'll get each to, into each one of these phases the goals and the issues they're trying to solve uh, in, uh, in just a second. First off, what does the AOM actually apply to? Well, here we have the complete picture, and what the AOM tries to do is to combine the HTML, the DOM tree, the accessibility tree, and JavaScript a lot closer together. So we, as developers, can use JavaScript to interact with the accessibility tree, but also give the DOM tree more um, uh, for instance, more events in order to have existing technology users be more powerful using accessible applications. Right? So let's dive right in. Let's go a little bit deeper. First off, the four phases they're planning to do implement this specification. In the first phase, they want to add ARIA as properties. Um, so we don't have to use attributes uh, at every single point, and we use JavaScript in order to add ARIA to our applications. First phase also thinks about um, getting web components more up to date. Like I said, they're not semantic, they're not accessible by themselves whatsoever, but the AOM has a few good ideas about this. The second phase is all about extending events to make the assistive technology user a lot more powerful to interact with our applications and have the software make it um, needing less uh, workarounds in order to interact with the applications. The third phase is all about creating virtual nodes or virtual trees. So we can get an uh, element like the canvas, which has this high-performance graphical UIs. You could maybe imagine a, a streaming desktop software or some navigation software, and add accessibility to just one node. And the final phase is all about introspection, checking if the previous phases all have been done right, but also if we have um, the accessibility added to our application, be correct, and get all the information from the accessibility tree. So the first phase, ARIA has properties and web components. This is actually already possible. In the ARIA 1.2 specification, which is shipping in Safari today and is behind a flag in Chrome, you can get an element reference and directly uh, apply ARIA attributes from JavaScript. So this is already quite powerful. When you do something like this, the attributes also get reflected into the HTML. And this already solves the problem with IDs, right? You can put your um, reference, your relationship defined in JavaScript, have your value of ID defined somewhere in your component or in your directive, and make sure all the elements use the same property to have that relationship. However, this is still not perfect, because if you have very large applications, you need unique IDs for each and every element. 
which can get a bit hassle. You can make a, a very long and unreadable ID, or so you could generate some, which means the linking becomes a lot harder. So for this, the ARA proposes to go one step further than linking, uh, setting relationships just by strings, namely by using the HTML elements themselves as a reference on, um, to, to create a relationship between two elements. These won't get reflected into the HTML, so you don't have a need for many global unique IDs. And you can have uh, everything set from your JavaScript, create a component or a directive for this in order to create these relationships. This also solves a different problem containing with web components. Web components are usually uh, have their own shadow root to be completely unique and separated from the global DOM. Here we have an example of a combo box, which has input inside the web component, and the user of the web component is able to set the option list from outside the web component. But if you want to create a relationship between the element that's inside the web component to something that's outside, that's impossible, because there's the ID properties actually scoped to the uh, shadow root. But if we can use the actual HTML elements themselves as a reference, we can use JavaScript to poke straight through the shadow root, get, an element, uh, get a reference to the element, and use it to create a relationship between the two elements in our application. This will not be reflected into the HTML, but it does result in um, the right information being added to the accessibility tree, and thus assistive technology users able to interact with the application. When we go a bit further into web components, like I said, they're not semantic by themselves whatsoever. So if a browser sees a web component like this, it has no idea what to do, what to put into the accessibility tree. So for now, either the user of the web components is forced to add all these properties, or the uh, web component author is forced to sprout all new ARIA um, properties from inside the web component. However, when the user of the web component changes one of these, the author also needs to write a lot of code in order to handle all these uh, certain use cases. Or if the user of the web component actually removes something, there's no default to fall back on. So what the AOM proposes is to add an extension to the current element internals API we're using for web components where we can actually use that internals property to add more information, uh, to, use the, uh, to add the ARIA information to the internal property. Um, this means there's a fallback, so when the user of a web component wants to override something, it's possible, and if they want to remove it, the information is still in the web component in order to add this information to the accessibility tree, without having the author of the web component needing to write a whole lot of code in order to interact, with, to, in order to handle all these situations. So that's the part about web components and ARIA properties. And we'll go further into uh, extended events, creating custom events for assistive technology in order to make it that easier for the software to interact with the application, but also for us as developers, because we get more semantic events that we can use in our code to listen, uh, to listen for. However, there's a small issue with this. Since the user of assistive technology has no other way of interacting with the application than, other than the accessibility tree, when you get a specific event from uh, this build for assistive technology, you can actually derive some information about the user, whether or not they're using assistive technology, and you can maybe do something with this information. But the AOM has a solution for this. First off, this is the, some of the events that assistive technology uses and the, um, the, which matches to a current DOM event, and these are the ones the AOM proposes to add. Dismiss, scroll by page, increment, and decrement. So when these get added to the DOM nodes, we as developers don't have to listen for, instance, the escape key, but we can listen for the cement event dismiss and already know, all right, we have to remove something from the page instead of having to read the code and interpret what's going on when someone presses the escape key. And to preserve the uh, privacy of the assistive technology user, the idea is to actually throw both events at the same time. So when a dismiss event happens, the escape key is also thrown, so you can listen for either of them. But also the other way around. When a user presses the escape key on a current element, the dismiss event is, al is also thrown. Which means, if always both events are thrown, the application is unable to, de to de determine whether this has come from the assistive technology, or whether this event has come from the normal DOM node. So this actually um, makes it a lot easier for assistive technology to interact with the application. It doesn't have to do certain workarounds to interact. And we get a few more semantic, more readable events to listen to, which always works according to the specification. 
Then I want to head into virtual nodes, of virtual trees. I gave the example of um, a canvas having a high-performance graphical UI. And, uh, very nice to be uh, to build. Very nice. It looks very nice on the screen. However, unable to be made accessible whatsoever. So what this phase actually proposes is that from one certain point in the DOM tree, you can create an entire new accessibility tree. You can create this through JavaScript, and with this accessibility tree, the assistive technology user can still interact with your canvas. And if they perform some action on a node, it will result in some click event on a certain area in the canvas, just like the user would have clicked a mouse somewhere. An example of such a high-performance graphic UI is a tic-tac-toe game that's on the uh, GitHub specification page for the AOM. And if you look right, here, uh, look right here, I have the canvas element selected. And you can check the accessibility tab in the Chrome developer tools. And you see there's actually an entire accessibility tree built for this uh, single element without using ARIA. Um, that which actually can, uh, can be used because there's only one element to add information into. Unfortunately, this doesn't work at the moment. If you try to um, uh, interact with the accessibility tree using assistive technology, Chrome crashes and it all just breaks down. However, I've had a bug report for this in, into Chrome, so hopefully it gets fixed in the future. The last phase is all about introspection, validating if the things we've added to our application to be made more accessible are done right. There are a few tools that you can use today that you can add into your continuous integration environment. For instance, Poly or Koali or maybe the Xcore library. The Xcore library is actually what Lighthouse uses when it uh, does the accessibility check on your application. And this can, have, uh, can do some static analysis on your application to make sure uh, whether your relationships are set right, whether certain properties or attributes have been added correctly. However, it doesn't give all the information, and maybe it gives information a bit late during the build time. Just a week ago, Minko actually tweeted out an update for uh, the CodeLizer, where we have these accessibility rules added into the CodeLizer plugin. So we can actually have some of these validation already from our IDE. So this already saves a lot of hassle in order to validate it all the way in the end. However, it's still not perfect. It's all about static analysis and having only the information available, either runtime or a few or through uh, rules. So what the AOM proposes is to add a brand new API, something called like the Computer Accessibility Tree API, which allows us to get the actual accessibility node information for a current element, which means we can also use that information to walk through the entire tree, uh, or just check whether that, uh, the implementation for accessibility has been done right for that uh, specific element. And this information we have no access to at the moment. You can only do static analysis. So this will be a very powerful tool in order to create better uh, tooling to check whether everything has been done right. It would be easier for developers to debug our application because you can walk through the tree. But you could also maybe try building your own screen reader, just you know, for fun. That's cool. What about support? Well, it's not that great. I mean, it's still experimental. It's still in development. Uh, the things that have been added, like phase three and phase four, are in Chrome behind the flag, and the syntax is not uh, as it is at the moment. However, uh, phase one, so having ARIA's properties is already added in the ARIA 1.2 specification. And having the ability um, to, you, to add more information to custom elements is being worked on since last July in Chrome. So hopefully, very soon, we can actually use it in our day-to-day uh, -day environments. So what can we do now? Well, one of the most important things you could do is promote the prioritization of accessibility within your company. If you remember, like I said in the beginning, if you take all the people, the um, temporary, the situational, and the permanent, all together, there's been, uh, they've calculated in America, over 20 million people could benefit from using assistive technology in accessible web applications. So actually, a lot of people could benefit from having well-done accessibility. Also, use semantic HTML. Leave the diffs to the side and use your nav, your field sets, your uh, header, footer, because these are all used to add more information to the accessibility tree, which gives assistive technology actually something to interact with uh, the application. Another easy thing to do is to check your colors. Color blindness is also uh, affects a very large group of people. And there are a lot of tools online that you can use in order to make sure your contrasts are right. Um, but also, don't only use colors to convey information. Don't only use red or green on your inputs to make sure whether they're valid or invalid. Always have something uh, available 
uh, like an error message for a vision impaired user who uses the Braille device and maybe have, even has, has no idea what a color is. One of the last fun things you could do is organize a screen reader workshop where you get a few uh, people together, download the manual for one of the screen readers, maybe for VoiceOver or NVDA, and try to do something either on the web or maybe in the application you're building using only the screen reader. I can guarantee you it's quite an experience, a frustratingly fun or funnily frustrating uh, experience, but I can wholeheartedly recommend it uh, to experience what some people have to do on the web in order to get our information. I'd like to close off with uh, a quote by Tim Berners-Lee, WC director and so-called father of the World Wide Web. The power of the web is in its universality. Access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. Thank you. <laughs>